my place. I call Pat Sheehan. Yeah, Gordon Mayogut, uh, Alas Concord, and I welcome the opportunity to speak at this debate today. I was on the, uh, the Justice Committee when Claire Sugden was Minister, uh, and, and I was there when we, the institutions were resurrected earlier this year. I've since moved on, but uh, the issues that I want to speak about today overlap with, the, with health, and, that, and that's the issue that I want to deal with here. It, because it's clear that there are a number of over, overlaps in this bill between the realms of justice and health, and this is most apparent when it comes to clauses 9, 11, and 17, which deal with the child aggravator and the exception to the aggravation where the perpetrator has parental responsibility for over a child. I recognise that there were some issues raised by organisations in relation to the parental responsibility exception. Significant are specifically the question of whether existing child protection legislation provided adequate protection for child victims of non-physical abuse. And this was raised by organisations like the uh, Children and Young uh, People's Commissioner, the Victim Support, Bernardo's, the NSPCC, Women's Aid and the Children's Law Centre and many others. And, and I thank all of them for their important contributions. It is directly because of these important contributions to the discourse of this bill that the Department of Justice decided, in consultation with officials from the Department of Health, to amend the bill to provide for more explicit protections for children as part of this bill. It is my view and the view of my party that quite clearly abuse is not limited to physical abuse. Whether this is domestic abuse or child abuse, it is important that all victims of abuse are, afford are afforded the same protections from non-physical abuse. Such abuse has a stark, damaging and lasting impact on a child, and such adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs as they uh, are known, can lead to serious damage to a person's life. Uh, ACEs are a growing topic in academic and political discourse due to the increasing awareness of the impact they can have on the child in later life, including mental health issues, addiction issues, educational, social and economic inequalities, and more. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child must be the baseline used when making decisions on protecting children. And more specifically, I want to draw attention to Article 3.1 of the UN CRC, which requires that the best interests of the child are a primary consideration. I believe that Amendment 12, which amends child cruelty legislation to make it explicitly clear in legislation that abuse can be non-physical, is an important amendment which will uh, engage the UN uh, uh, CRC in a much more meaningful way and will provide much greater safeguards for children who may be subject to abuse. The, this amendment will have the effect of making it clear that it would be an offence whether the suffering or injury caused to a child was physical or psychological in nature, for example, isolation, humiliation or bullying. This goes further than provisions in legislation in all other jurisdictions of these islands, and this is to be commended. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I speak directly to Amendment 9 and 11 first. The SDLP position is that it recognises the lowering of the age to 16 ensures those victims aged 16 to 18 who cannot seek legal redress from other provisions will be captured in this new offence. We also note that the bill is not intended as the legislative pathway for persons under the age of 16 for domestic abuse offences against them. They, unlike the 16 and 17 year olds served by this amendment, are reliant on the Children's and Young Persons Act. Um, I was going to quote the letter from the Minister at this point, but I, I think it is sufficiently on record at this stage, which talked us through the reasoning behind um, Department's thinking here, and I accept that. What I will say is, while I support the Minister's amendment in this regard and in wanting to cover all young people, the SDLP shares concerns raised by others 
that an inequality in sentencing will arise from this disjointed approach. And I appreciate I did have the opportunity to speak um, with the Minister briefly on this during our last committee meeting of the Justice Committee. And I accept that the outcome is, um, is not entirely within the gift of this Minister to resolve. I would, however, urge that she uh, work along with the Minister for Health to ensure that any inequality that is raised um, although arguably co the correct thing to do, but if that inequality is raised at this time, that urgent action is taken to swiftly rectify that. On to Amendment 12, uh, the, new cause, the new clause, the definitions of the cruelty offence. Again, um, I see how that is required to align for the, the age factor and will be supporting of that. Amendment 13. Um, the committee amendment, I think the, the chair of the committee has outlined very well the committee's position on that. I do think it is a reasonable uh, presentation at this time, and it does allow for a reasonable time period for the department to act. I would also um, further to, rather than reiterate what has been said, and further to the, the minister's intervention, I would um, highlight the fact that within the regulations, the, it is sufficiently vague. It does say that the regulations may include provisions of, so any consultation process that opens up will have sufficient regard to what is heard during that consultation. So I, I don't accept that that um, would be a valid grounds not to move and support that amendment, Amendment 13. Amendment 14, um, the member who's moving this amendment will know I have huge sympathy for this amendment. Um, it was my intention, however unsuccessful to this point, to, to genuinely try to understand the position of the victim. And in very many cases, unless we have this piece right, the part where we talk about um, the support to the victim, victims may never present themselves. They may never have the confidence to come forward. And we had to look at all the empowering tools that we could possibly reach for to help those victims come forward and present their case. And one of the concerns I had um, and continue to have is that financial restraint that if the perpetrator has restricted access to finance, the person may fail. That, that could be the deciding factor on, on not actually taking action. And likewise, um, this, bill, this amendment speaks to one of the other issues, which is legal aid. Um, and it's that recurring um, effect. And I know, I, I know the member who brought the amendment forward will speak to that. But it, it is that, um, I suppose, speaking to that, the, the perpetrator really trying to break the person in every possible way they can. And if one of the tools for them to do that is continually persistently bringing that person to court over minor offences and unfounded offences. Just the process of having to do that and having to defend yourself is another form of abuse. And I can see how the legal aid system stepping in would prevent the effect that the perpetrator would hope. So the, the victim who is being dragged to the courts perpetually won't become financially broke by that if legal aid sweeps in and supports them. But as the Minister said, this piece, I suppose, has not been developed as fully as it could, because what of those victims who may not run the full course of this bill but are taking case be outside it, they too would be deserving of that support. So I know that I have spoken uh, at length with the member who brought this forward, and I am torn because I do see that it's not a perfect piece at this stage. But that said, the SDLP will be supporting it because I think to anchor it now on the face of the bill is the right thing to do, and it allows us to tease out all those further conversations around it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call Doug Beatty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I, will be, I will be brief, I think, because um, there's a lot of information that has come across already. Uh, I think it addresses an awful lot of this, and, and there's no point standing talking just for the sake uh, of, of talking. And, and there are other people who I really need to listen to um, before I can make a, a, a fully informed choice, if I'm, if I'm really honest. Um, but absolutely, uh, Amendment 9 and 11, and moving 
from 18 down to 16, uh, we absolutely support. We understand what is trying to be achieved. It's not ideal, um, <coughs> but we will be um, supporting that. Uh, in regards to um, Clause 12, the new clause, this really is welcome. This really is a welcome clause. Um, a definition of child, child cruelty offences is really needed. Um, and, and I welcome this, and, I, and, 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 and I'm glad the Minister uh, has brought this in, um, because this will give us so much powers to be able to protect um, young children um, or children um, uh, with this legislation. Uh, in regards to uh, Amendment 13, uh, I, I'm, I'm, struck by, I'm struck by this line within it, which says protection and supporting the victim. Um, and cl clearly, the whole bill is about protecting and supporting the victim uh, in some way or another. And domestic abuse protection orders and notices uh, are one of the reasons, are one of the ways. To do that, and I guess there is nearly everybody in here who will have come across somebody who has been a victim of domestic abuse in some way or, or, or another. Um, I, I certainly have, um, and the individual who, who I know was a, was a male, uh, and he was being abused by his wife while the children were in the house. And after he had been abused, and when I say abused, I mean physically abused, he would leave the house because that's what men do. They leave the house, they leave the children and the wife in the house, and he went out. And when he went out the door, there was nothing there to protect him. There was nothing there to support him legally. And all he could then do was traipse back into the house again. And he came back into the house again and he was abused all over again. And that cycle continued until I got him out of the house and I got him accommodation and I moved him away from there and I went through a system of getting him access to his children. So I think um, the new clause, which is Amendment 13, uh, is, is, is a justified clause. I think it's a good clause. I think we should uh, definitely be supporting it, that my party will be um, supporting it. Um, I have absolute sympathy with the, the Justice Minister, and maybe in the further consideration phase uh, we, can, we can enhance it or, or, or deal with it. But, but I think it needs to be in there, uh, uh, and to use a phrase already used, it needs to be anchored uh, into the Bill. Um, in regards to Amendment 14, uh, I will say this now, is I am absolutely minded to support Amendment 14, and we have discussed this. Um, with, with Ms Woods, uh, and I absolutely understand what she's trying to achieve. Absolutely understand it. But I just need it expanded a little bit more. I don't think I have as much information as I, as I want. And remember what I said at the start, that was, you know, I, I want to finish because I want to hear other people. And one of the other people I want to hear is, is Ms Woods to, 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 to give us some uh, information uh, in regards to this. Uh, and of course, I think uh, Mr Frew is going to talk about it as well. You know, and, and it does speak a lot for the Assembly that when you come in here, you can sit and listen to other people and possibly change your mind uh, in regards to one of the clauses. But I am minded to support it. Um, uh, it certainly is something that we can get into the bill and enhance at a later stage. Um, uh, but I would like to hear some more information uh, in regards to that. Because, um, and, and I don't know if this addresses it or not, but we all know of, of occasions where one parent um, in, a, in an abuse case is getting legal aid and the other one is not getting legal aid and what is happening is the other one is financially drying the other one out completely, which is another form of, a, of domestic abuse. You know, so it's, a, it's an endless cycle, I suppose. Um, but a, a little bit more information on that uh, would just help me out here, but I'm certainly minded to support. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I call Paula Bradshaw. Deputy Speaker, I rise to support Amendments 9, 11 and 12 and to oppose Amendments 13 and 14. Amendment 9 to Clause 11 is an important clarification that non-physical ill-treatment of someone aged 16 or 17 will be captured by the offence. This has been placed in this group alongside Amendment 11 to Clause 17 because it does the same thing, clarifying that the domestic abuse aggravator also applies if the victim is aged 16 to 17. Amendment 12 is an additional clause which then enhances this based on evidence received by the committee making non-physical ill-treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them an offence and clarifying that any suffering or injury need not necessarily be physical. 
I do have concerns with Amendment 13, not because I oppose its intent, but in fact because I do support it. I do not believe, however, that um, with such an important process, a very significant element amounting to 35 clauses of the equivalent bill in England and Wales should be taken forward through regulations. Instead, it should be properly consulted upon with the public and scrutinised by this committee and not least by sorry, the Assembly and not least by the Justice Committee as part of forthcoming primary legislation in this Assembly term. In my and my party's view, it is simply the case that the interests of victims are best served by a thorough process, making sure we get it right. Um, while I suspect I have sympathy with the intent of Amendment 14, I am unclear about the wording, and I simply do not believe that it would be workable as it stands. It should be emphasised that legal aid is already available to anyone who needs it to secure a non-molestation order. People with high incomes do make a small contribution towards a representation, but no one is paying thousands or even hundreds of pounds for this. Nevertheless, this is something we will continue to look at, particularly because one common um, means of control is to remove access to funds. So if the intent is to ensure that no one can bring a case of domestic abuse due to lack of funds, that is something we would like to achieve within the Bill via an appropriate amendment if necessary. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is worth emphasising that no one is removing parental responsibility. There is a reasonable behaviour defence and standard penalties, such as grounding or removing access to social media, do not fall within the scope of this bill. Thank you. I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And again, uh, the second stage here of this debate, which has been a very good debate. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, definitely, this is the business end of our job. Uh, and here we have a certain section of, of the amendments and clauses that we should look at. And um, if I could start off with Amendment 12. Um, well, amend, Amendment 11 is, is reducing the age from 18 to 16. I think we all recognise the gap in that, and, and there's no problem that, that way, uh, lowering the age uh, rega regarding the aggravation on one issue and then and lowering the age on the other. There's no issue there. Um, we see the gap, we, we see the anomaly that that's created, so there's no, no problem there. And Amendment 12, the new clause, meaning of ill treatment, etc., of uh, offence provision, absolutely uh, no problem with that either. Uh, I agree with uh, Doug and his assessment of that and, and the story that he, he told on that. So then we move on to Amendment 13 and uh, Amendment 14. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can remember a time in the last term when I brought an amendment. I think it was Justice Number Two, but it could have been Justice Number One. My, me my memory's sketchy. Where I brought forward an amendment to something to do something similar with regards to uh, orders, and the minister at the time was Mr. David Ford, and he gave me a commitment in this very house, that if I was to withdraw my amendment, that he would carry it on. He criticised the wording of it. He said it was untidy. Uh, I would agree with him, it probably was. But I felt and I thought that me having that amendment on the list, forcing the minister to talk to it, I was able to affect change in that regard. That change didn't happen. It didn't happen any time soon. And whilst I thought I was a good, doing a good thing and I removed the amendment, didn't push it, I had the word of the minister. With all due respect to the minister, time moves on and things happen and things do not get done. So I understand that. So I understand why. It's critically important that the, the committee, when they have had this opportunity to put down this amendment, that we grasp it. That we grasp it. And can I say, on Amendment 13, with the new clause with regards to interim protection for the victim, it is actually a gift for the minister. It is actually a gift that we have presented as a committee to the minister. 
We could have went down a more arduous route. We could have took legislation from other arts and parts, other jurisdictions within the United Kingdom, and put them in this bill. But we realised, we recognised as a committee, that would not be the right thing to do. Because our Justice Minister, our Justice Department, needed to make sure that whatever vehicle they use, it's fit for purpose for Northern Ireland. And that's very important. It's very important that we, have, we adapt the vehicle to suit us. And that's why it's written the way it is. That's why it's so vague in the way it is. The Department of Justice may, by regulation, within 24 months of commencement, make provision for measures which may be made for the purpose of protecting and supporting the victim or alleged victim. This is all about protecting and supporting the victim. The regulations may include provisions about court orders, B, measures other than court orders. It can't be any more vague than that. When I brought this, my amendment away back then, Justice Number Two, I think, to David Ford, the Minister, my amendment was very prescriptive. It basically nailed my colours to the mast, and it asked David Ford to do the Minister at the time to do something. I removed that amendment, and to be honest with you, I regret it. So we do not, we should not remove this amendment. We should move this amendment. And this amendment should be passed in this House because it's affording the Justice Minister of today the ability to shape the vehicle in which she wishes to take forward in a timely fashion. 24 months. That shouldn't be too ambitious. And if it is, then there's something wrong with the system. There's something badly wrong. Now, we know cogs turn slow in this place, too slow for my liking. But 24 months to get something that's desperately needed? Yes, I will, yeah. Would the member accept that within that 24 month period there will be a change um, of executive? There will be a general election called in respect of the Assembly? Um, that the executive will have to enter into negotiations to reform an executive, and that can take a considerable period of time. And during that period, the officials would not be in a position um, to be able to take direction from a minister. We also know this year, with the onset of COVID, that there are other um, undeterminables and unforeseeables that could happen in that period. And so to place on the face of primary legislation a duty to do something within a time frame of two years places the department at high risk. The question and the difference between us is not whether or not this needs to be done, but whether or not it is wise to place the department, not me, the department at risk of judicial review should this fall, because no doubt it will be a different minister who will end up having to fight that case in court. I thank the member for the intervention and I hear her appeals. And again, if we want to amend this so that it's a shorter period of time, I'm up for that debate. Because two years, 24 months is enough time. And what the Minister fails to point out is this. She has told this committee, she has told this House that she is going to bring forward legislation that would deal with this issue straight away. Yeah, yeah. And I thank the member again for giving me the opportunity to clarify. This would place a duty on my officials to do two things. First of all, to engage in nugatory work to bring forward secondary um, legislation, which we don't believe is the correct vehicle, whilst at the same time the same officials and the same resource is then split to try to advance primary legislation where this can be dealt with properly. I realise that the member gets frustrated at the pace of change, but each person has, has only limited capacity to be able to deliver, and if they are to do both of those things, one of those things will suffer, and one of them is unnecessary. So it is not helpful to ask a small team, and it is a small team, to divert all their attention onto producing both secondary and primary legislation on the same issue, and divert them away from all of the other work, including the domestic abuse strategy, which the member would be the first to criticise us if we were to do that. I thank the member and minister for her intervention, and she can, she can make all the excuses for her department that she wants. But this committee wishes to see this amendment through, and I hope that this House sees the rationale and the reason why 
we want to see and we need to see this amendment through. It is not putting a duplication. It is not placing a burden on the department whenever it is the same thing that we're asking for. And the outcome will be the same. And surely the minister can see, along with her officials, that this is the end game. This is where we need to get to. So, so I, for the life of me, cannot see why this minister and this department would be so against Amendment 13 that asks and requests of her that she do this. And she shapes, her department shapes the vehicle for which she moves forward in order to protect victims of this heinous crime. I, I do not for the life of me see what the problem is in regards to that. It's happening everywhere else but here. Now I get and we get. Yes. Yeah. The member has said he does not understand why it is a duplication of resources. Mr Speaker, I know that it is unusual for a minister to ask a, a member a question, but does he understand that primary legislation is a, con a completely different vehicle, a completely different drafting exercise, and has completely different um, standards than primary legislation, that secondary and primary are not the same thing? It is not about drafting one piece of legislation which will either be primary or secondary. Primary legislation is different to secondary legislation. Does the member understand that that requires us to do two things at the same time and split our resource between them, rather than focus on the one thing that he wants, which is to get these delivered? And I thank the, man, the Minister for Intervention. But she must, she must realise that an amendment to a bill can be cooked up and produced within hours, within days. And that is, the, that is the process for which the Minister has already outlined that she's going to use as a vehicle. So, so I, would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would ask the House, because we can, we can bat, we can have a tennis game all we want here tonight. It's not going to serve any more purpose, I don't think. But I would plead with the House, consider this amendment, consider everything I've said with regards to my history in this place, my experience in this place, in trying to affect change. Trying to affect change. And we have given the Minister as wide a scope as the committee could possibly give. This is a gift to this department, this Minister. I wish and I hope that she takes it. Moving on then to uh, Rachel Woods. Uh, and I'm making a bad habit of this. I'm going to have to stop it. I'm going to get into real trouble by my party. Because right. I'm going to have to praise Rachel Woods once again. Because, because, well, here's the thing, and it's very, very important. Rachel Woods came onto this committee and she gets this bill. This is her first, I think it's her first attempt, and she gets it. That's ex we would have some place, we would have some chamber, we would have some committees. If every member was as committed as that. I'm going to have to stop this, I really am. But why, why am I so passionate about this? And I thank Rachel for her amendment because it ticks a very big box. It ticks a very big box. Now, I admit it's taken me a while to see that this amendment does it, and I would suggest that we probably need to go further, and I'm up for that debate. I really am. It's probably a wee bit too limited time with regards to further consideration, but I put the minister on notice. Uh, but why is this needed? My colleague, Johnny Buckley, uh, organised a meeting uh, a number of months ago with a young lady who will remain nameless, of course, who wanted to meet with me and the chairperson, Paul Gavin. And she outlined for us in great detail the devastation, the absolute devastation to her life and her children's lives because an ex-partner wouldn't let her go, would not let her go and tormented her day in, day out, not by nuisance phone calls, not by stalking, not by rumour and gossip, but by court. 
by court. Make no mistake, and I'm sure members in this house will, will know that experience and have heard these stories. People use court as a weapon. And that is such a powerful tool in the hands of the wrong person. And here's how it can happen. A perpetrator of domestic violence or any other sort of crime can go to court to gain access to children and they can keep going back. Now, there's meant to be safeguards in place in court. I'm sure if there's a certain member in the house, it probably would remind me of that. But that seems to be failing because there's people in this country, both female and male, who are being taken to court over and over and over and over and over and over again. Hans Sard will enjoy that. They keep being taken to court and their resources, their financial capacity is reduced to selch, to zero, to nyet. And it is not fair and it, 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 it reduces the capacity to some, for somebody to move on with their life and their children's lives. Yes, I will. I thank the member for giving way and for his particular reference to my constituent's case. And I think in listening to what he has said and what the committee have, have done in relation to this bill, that her story, being able to be, have access to speak to the chair of the Justice Committee and indeed yourself, and I thank you both for giving that opportunity to her. But she is empowered now by the actions taken by the Justice Committee. Would the member agree with me that her story not only affected that young lady financially, but psychologically by the continual attempts to bring her and her family through the courts, financially crippled her in such a way that her family, namely her grandmother, gave up so much to ensure that that young lady could keep her, fa her family together. And in that regard, I thank the member for his comments in relation to that case. Yes. And you can see the unfairness in all of that. You can see where there's been hard-earned cash savings, lifetime savings being reduced each stage of the way. And, and, and you know something? Court proceedings are not pretty. Court proceedings is not go in on the Tuesday and come out on the Wednesday. It takes stages upon stages and months upon months to go through a court process. There are solicitors to pay, there are bar sometimes barristers to pay, and there is no legal aid. But the perpetrator can get legal aid. So there's nothing to lose for that person, but there's everything to lose for the victim in this case. And it is the case that court is being used as a weapon. The very house of justice, the very place of justice, is being used against a victim, a person, a single mum, a single mum with three children, I think. This, it has to be stopped. It has to be halted. Will the member give way? Yes, yes, I will. I appreciate the, the member giving way and uh, elaborating on our party position in respect of this. Uh, and again, thank you to, to my colleague from Upper Band, Mr Buckley, that uh, brought that uh, lady to see us. Uh, the member, the member will appreciate, and again, Ms. Woods will, will no doubt elaborate on this. My, my reading of the amendment is that this relates to uh, victims of this offence that is being created. Therefore, there isn't a retrospective nature applicable to this, or indeed a wider net for other type of offences. But nevertheless, this could be the catalyst for the wider changes that we would like to see as a party in supporting victims of domestic abuse to ensure that the courts are not used for the very reasons that the member has outlined. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more and thanks, thank the member for putting that on the record. But whenever we spoke to this in the committee last week, the, the officials were unclear, uh, and again, 
unfairly because it is not their place of expertise and we got further clarification. But the officials, the department was not clear as to the cost burden of this new clause. And it was cited that it could run into, I think it was tens of millions, if I'm right, if my memory is right. Well, my good. Yes, yes, I will give away. Yeah. Member for Giving Way, I believe the um, statement was double figure millions. For that clarification, my memory is not the way it used to be. Um, so, yes, double. So, and, and, and I was sitting in the committee chamber and my mouth hit the floor. Because if this is the burden, if this would be the burden in the bill, cost burden to legal aid, well then equate that to a single mum's purse, equate that to a, 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 a single dad's purse, equate that to a nurse, equate that to a spark. Create that to a bin man or a woman. And that amount of money is what's then going out of hard earned hands, if that is the case. So the department can't have it both ways. If it is millions, millions upon millions, yes, yes, I'll give way to the minister who raises her hand. Would the member accept that equally um, members can't have it both ways? They can't both demand that the department bring the bill for legal aid um, under control and reduce it, and at the same time argue that the bill for legal aid should be changed and the rules for legal aid should be changed without due diligence um, on our part and without checking how much it will cost so that we can quantify the changes, make sure those changes are effective and proportionate, and make sure that they're affordable? And the Minister, and I thank her for intervention because it's been very powerful. She has hit the nail right on the head. Why is legal aid not protecting people like this? In fact, why is legal aid? Why are we financing people to use this as a weapon against the victims? Yes, the Minister has indicated with her. I thank the member for being generous and giving way because I think it is important that we deal with these issues as they arise. It is already within the gift of the judiciary to rule that claims um, to go back to the family courts are vexatious. They must reach a decision. So if a partner continues to drag his partner into court on a repeated basis for no reason other than to cause them harm, the judiciary can already say that they should not be allowed to do that and can exercise that power at any time. Currently, there is also a waiver in place which will allow people um, to be able to access legal aid um, in cases where they don't meet the financial, um, the, the, the financial threshold. But that relies on them still being able to make some contribution to the costs, which at the higher courts can be very significant. This would not be a complete waiver that we're talking about. And it would only affect those who are convicted of these specific offences, not other offences that might also constitute domestic abuse, but alternative provisions have been made for in terms of prosecution that we discussed earlier. So for all of those reasons, the reason that some people can do this and others can't is simply maintenance, Mr Speaker. So if you have the money to fund your own case, you are expected to do so. And if you do not, then the Legal Services Agency is there to support you in order that you can access justice. And I thank the Minister for further clarification. But if, as I understand it, what this amendment by uh, Ms Rachel Woods does is it allows the Director of Legal Aid Services to display financial eligibility rules for victims of domestic abuse and family proceedings, for example, child contact and residence orders. This will go some way to providing financial support and access to justice for victims that ha are having their resources drained and are subject to re-traumatisation and further abuse by perpetrators exploiting the justice system. Now, if I'm wrong in that, I'm happy to give either Minister or the proposer of the amendment uh, a way in. But their woman's aid will be watching this, and I'm sure they're screaming at the TV at this present time, because this is happening. They see it every day. They have to fight tooth and nail for these victims on a daily basis. I've received an email 
from Woman's Aid not so long ago, the 13th of November, I've lost track of time, a couple of days ago, where they outline, they outline the cost burden for a victim in this regard. And whilst I won't go into the itemised cost, because it would take me all night, from May 2019 to October 2020, there was six settings of court. Six settings of court throughout that time. Now you imagine from May 2019 to October 2020, just ending, just ending. The burden, the psychological burden on that victim, having to prepare for the next court sitting. May, November, July, September, October, October. Nearly, you know, when, when is there a free month there? When, there is, when is there a month in that space of time where that victim can get their head shot? And then, of course, you have your council fees, you have your solicitor's fees, your court fees, everything else. Professional costs and outlay for that period of time was two thousand. £950.50. This is a single mum. This is a single mum with a job, trying to provide for a family, with a mortgage, with car payments, with school fees, with lockdown. Yes, I'll give way to the minister, yeah. yeah. Perhaps to save um, the member some time and the chamber some time, uh, Mr Speaker, there is no need to convince me that there is an issue. I have already acknowledged that in my opening remarks. I believe there is an issue. It is a serious issue. It is one that I would wish to address. But I do not believe that this amendment has either the policy development behind it to ensure that it is, it is adequate for purpose, nor do I believe and that in terms of how it addresses the issue, it allows us to look at all of the other mechanisms in front of us. So there's no need to labour the point about the seriousness of the issue. We are all in this chamber agreed on that. It is simply about the appropriate way of addressing the problem, that we have a slight difference. I thank the Minister for Intervention, but yes, it is correct that we clearly define the problems out there. It is correct because we have a problem here. We have an amendment. You disagree with it. The House will decide. So it's important that we elaborate on these issues and we stress the importance of why this impacts on people's lives so grievously. And it's important that we outlay all of that for these people involved. That's only one court session that I've described. There was then the appeal, defending the appeal, in the Family Care Centre also which robbed that person of another thousand pounds. Again, this is a mum, single mum, with child maintenance for two children and everything that goes with it. These people are being deprived of their funding, their hard-earned cash, money that they are prepared to save to ensure that their children get everything they need everything that's required for school, for holidays, for breaks away, for food on the table, everything. And they are being deprived, their money is going down, and it's the court and all the legal services with it that's taking it off them because a perpetrator is using court as a weapon. That is the long and short of it. So that's why I support this clause. That's why this clause is needed. I don't think it goes far enough in that regard, but this could be the start of a journey that could lead to us. And if it takes the whole gambit of legal aid to do it, let's do it. There should be no mountain too big to climb in this assembly or this executive or for any minister. Let's tackle legal aid once and for all. Let's get it sorted. And let's, let's not beat about the bush in that regard. So I support Ms Rachel Wood's amendment in this regard and let's see where it takes us. And I plead with this House tonight, whilst you have the time to support 
Clause 14, Rachel Woods, and the clue to, uh, to support the chairman when he puts down Amendment 13. These are important. These are very important. Do not lose the opportunity. Do not waste the time. Take it now. Grasp it. Don't, like, don't be like me, withdrawing an amendment on the sound commitment by the minister on the record, even in this house. It didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Pass these amendments. Let's get this done. Thank you. Sir Sean Lynch. On count, I call Sean Lynch. Uh, can call you, or last can call you. Uh, as a former member of the committee and current member of the policing board, I want to speak in, uh, in support of Amendment 13, which is a committee amendment which would place responsibility on the Justice Minister to make provisions for domestic abuse protection orders and notices within 24 hours, or other measures aimed at protecting and supporting victims of domestic abuse. I note that current legislation provides for the domestic violence protection orders, notices, however they were never introduced. As outlined by the Chair, I also note that the orders and notices are being replaced by new domestic abuse protection orders and notices in England and Wales to address the broader definition of domestic abuse and address some operational shortcomings experienced in relation to these orders. There is widespread support for the introduction of these new orders. Indeed, this issue was considered by the Policing Board, who also agreed there would be considerable merit in the introduction and provide victims with protection for a period of time after an incident. I understand that though there is no outright objection to the introduction of these orders, the PSNA did highlight concerns with existing arrangements and suggested that further consultation would be beneficial prior to their introduction. It is, all, it is concerning that victims of domestic violence here in the north of Ireland have already went a considerable time with any, uh, without any form of these protection notices and would like to see them introduced. However, I also understand the need for more consultation to ensure the best possible form of protection moving forward. Victims must be afforded all possible protections and ensure their safety and to ensure that cycles of abuse are ended. I therefore welcome this amendment which places a duty on the Justice Minister to provide a scheme within 24 months of commencing of this legislation and I would welcome their, their introduction into the Justice Miscellaneous Bill which I believe will be coming next year. The success of legislation is dependent on its affected, effective imp implementation. Whilst the reporting of domestic abuse has increased, particularly since the introduction of lockdown due to COVID, the reality is still uh, it's an unreported crime, and the figures outlined earlier by the Minister are stark. I would like to welcome the proactive fo focus of the PSNA on tackling this increase in domestic abuse cases that were seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill will be a landmark piece of legislation which, once implemented, will make a huge difference to the lives of so many. I have full confidence in the PSNA ability to implement this legislation. However, they will need support in their efforts to do so. I believe this legislation will be transformative in the lives of many victims and it must be a priority for the Department to ensure that appropriate resources are dedicated to this work to ensure full potential this legislation is realised. I call Gordon Dunn. Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak today in the House on this very important issue of domestic abuse, and I welcome the significant steps forward which have been made over recent years in getting us to the advanced stage. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will not get into all the details. I think I'm very fortunate as a DUP member to have two other colleagues of great experience. We have the Chair, Paul Given, and the former Chair, Paul Frew, who have covered in great detail the amendments, and I'm willing to follow their lead in relation to these issues. Not always, but I will do in this case follow their lead. I'll make a few general points. Uh, Chair, 
I would like to acknowledge all of those victims, agencies across the community and voluntary sectors, officials and justice agencies, including the PSNI, who have continued to support victims of this most horrific form of abuse and have also constructively engaged in the process to get to where we are today. The dedication of many organisations that are working to support victims and survivors of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland must be commended and they have literally been a lifesaver to so many people across our communities, giving victims security, safety and hope for their future. There is no doubt that there is greater public awareness of domestic abuse, and I think that is down to the hard work of many of these groups and organisations from right across society who are working day and night to tackle this very serious issue. And I would like to pay tribute to the North Down and Arge Women's Aid Group, based in Bangor, within my own constituency, with whom I have engaged with, and I know they play a very valuable role in supporting victims of domestic abuse. There has been a considerable amount of work done to date to get to this advanced stage, and we have heard it in great detail here today, including from all members of the committee who have worked constructively to try and tailor this bill to best meet local needs. I know from the various evidence gathering engagements and sessions that we have had with the Justice Committee that there is a united desire to ensure, well almost united I think would be right, to desire that no stone is left unturned as we seek to eradicate this appalling abuse, which unfortunately still happens every day and indeed night right across Northern Ireland. Domestic abuse can affect everyone, as already been said, regardless of someone's age, race, religion, gender or wealth, and even the address or their disability, and very often has no end point. It is torturous and sadly can result in generational harm which can never be repaired. Home should be the safest place for everyone. However, tragically, it can become the most dangerous place to be. Throughout the, the COVID pandemic, with the lockdowns and the periods of restrictions, as the places to escape from the home may be closed due to restrictions, whether that be simply going to a football match or even out for coffee or a haircut and a chat with friends or family members. Domestic incidents and crimes in Northern Ireland were already at a 15-year high before the COVID-19. Data from NISRA shows in the last year the number of domestic abuse crime cases rose to 18,796, an increase of 13% on the previous year, which amounts to an average of 51 incidents per day. The fact that over 8,300 incidents of domestic abuse were reported to the PSNI during the, the COVID-19 lockdown, according to the Department, between April and June this year, and a further 567 domestic abuse calls were made to the police in the final week of March, are very alarming statistics and confirm the need for action to tackle domestic abuse. As alarming as these statistics are, which are replicated right across the UK, what could be just as alarming, if not more so, is the number of cases of abuse which are not reported to anyone due to the fear of repercussions. That silent figure that we will tragically never see in our newspapers or indeed in Assembly Minister's answers must never be forgotten, and that is why we need to see further progress on this issue. The PSNI must be given the tools that are robust and far-reaching with the legislation to support victims through any form of domestic abuse and also to ultimately bring the perpetrators to justice. I know from engaging with the PSNI locally within our own North Down constituency on a very regular basis, I often hear of incidents of domestic violence and the fact that we are the only part of the UK not to have non-physical abusive behaviour included, including coercive control as a criminal offence this does currently limit the powers of the PSNI to effectively tackle this problem. Operation Encompass, that is discussed extensively within the committee, uh, with the option for schools to be notified of a, a domestic abuse incident, which may have taken place the night before in a, in a home, is a tool which does have the potential to support a child, which have, may have witnessed directly or indirectly a form of domestic abuse. However, this would have to be carried out in a very sensitive and confidential manner to ensure the child is not further victimised through perhaps peer bullying 
within the classroom, should the PSNI notify the school in a non-discreet way. Prevention and early intervention is crucial, and domestic abuse can even have an impact on the unborn child. Research identifies that domestic abuse is an adverse childhood experience and a contributing factor to a wide range of issues, such as educational underachievement, something I know our Education Minister Peter Weir very much recognises and is actively working on addressing through a partnership approach within this department, his department. Children are often seen, the unseen victims of domestic abuse, and children who are victims of domestic abuse can suffer a wide range of long-term mental, emotional and physical effects. I welcome the progress to date, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I trust that we will continue to see progress through the House, and I look forward to hearing further from the Minister. As, well, we've already heard quite a bit from the Minister, but I look forward to hearing, finally, as we seek to support victims of domestic abuse, many of whom suffer in silence. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I guess Aram Sir Colum Gildenu, Shin Kahilach and Kostya Slanty. I call Colum Gildenu Chair of the Health Committee. Gormayagat, last Kian Kolya, and I'm delighted to be able to speak this afternoon or tonight on this very important piece of legislation. And I have to say that I, uh, I think it, someone mentioned earlier in the debate, in the course of the debate, that this is possibly some of the most important legislation that will be considered during this mandate, and I think that's absolutely true. In my previous career as a social worker, I became aware of the hugely pervasive and pernicious nature of this type of offence um, and behaviour in our society. So I'm glad, and I, I'm also struck tonight, what the first meeting I think that I did officially after I became an MLA was in conjunction with my two colleagues here, Gemma Dolan and Sean Lynch, with Women's Aid in Inniskillen, and we committed that we would try to do something as MLAs in relation to this issue, and I'm pleased and, and proud to be at least partially doing that tonight. However, uh, in terms of speaking as Health Committee Chair, I recognise that the, the vast majority of the work of this has been done by the Justice Committee, and I have to say I'm very impressed with the level and the quality and the rigour of the debate here tonight in relation to every element of this bill, and it is a fascinating process to see the work that goes into that. I rise tonight to speak in particular to Amendment 13 within this group as Chair of the Health Committee. The Committee took evidence from Women's Aid the Men's Advisory Project and NSPCC, who flagged the range of areas in which more could and should be done to support survivors of domestic abuse, to ensure that the justice system does not exacerbate an already difficult situation for victims, and to reduce the risk of people staying in abusive relation and dangerous relationships due to practical fears around financial support or losing their home. The regulation making power proposed in Amendment 13 could create an opportunity to address some of the deficits identified, and I would like to set out three areas where this power could usefully be considered as a means of providing support. First, members agreed that the, the case had been made for speeding up and streamlining the handling of domestic abuse cases from start to finish. The victims of these crimes are particularly vulnerable. The abuse has a high and enduring impact, which can be compounded by protracted proceedings and a commitment to a shortened time frame could encourage people to come forward and make use of the new offence. Secondly, the Health Committee was persuaded by the stakeholder evidence of the need for paid leave to facilitate victims of domestic abuse making arrangements to separate from their partner. For a victim to extricate themselves from such a situation creates enormous upheaval and worries around finance and job security can tip the balance away from making that crucial right choice for an individual or a family. Paid leave could alleviate that pressure somewhat. Another key concern highlighted by stakeholders is the risk of homelessness. The committee noted the inherent problem in expecting the victim to move out of the family home, often with children, as a key step in dealing with abuse. There is an added difficulty where, for example, the home is adapted to cater for disability. The committee also acknowledged that the absence of sufficient refuge places could also limit effectiveness of the bill. The committee heard evidence from Women's Aid that refuges are usually running at 100% occupancy, while the Men's Advisory Project stated that there are no refuges for men experiencing domestic abuse. 
The committee were concerned that consideration be given to help avoid situations where people stay in abusive relationships through fear of losing their home. I, would therefore, I welcome therefore the indication in this chamber that the Minister for Communities is giving consideration to this issue. I would like to thank uh, those stakeholders who assisted the committee with their our deliberations around the parts of this bill that affected that were related to health. Um, the Health Committee has not formally considered Amendment 13, but would wish these objectives to be achieved by this or other means. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'll not take too long again, like, like Group 1, um, because I believe that this House has a lot of debate that has happened so far, and some people have mentioned some of the things that I wanted to speak about. Um, I'm standing tonight in support of 9, 11 and 12, but having listened to the debate, I agree with the Minister that I would have to oppose um, Amendments 13 and 14, and the rationale for that is... The new clause, thir in Amendment 13, the new clause... Um, means that the, the basis that the domestic abuse protection notices and orders provisions um, should be included in future primary legislation. And the Minister has already said that that is being planned for in the miscellaneous provisions bill, where the details then can be set out. The Amendment 13, while it may not intend to do this, it would relegate to, sec to secondary legislation 35 clauses that have been mentioned by others are in the English and Welsh legislation. Um, then moving on then to um, number f the new clause 14. Um, as the Minister has said, the judiciary can prevent repeated cases being brought to court. Um, but we have to remember as well that this would also confer discretionary power on the Legal Services Agency to waive the financial eligibility test in the private family law cases and circumstances where the applicant has been the victim of domestic abuse offence. And while I can certainly understand the intent here, there are several reasons why this isn't right, and it's, it is technical. Um, I don't think that the amendment is going to do what it's thought to do. Um, for example, victims, as the minister has actually said already, may need to pay something up front. And for someone who is on benefits and maybe has been denied access to money, that makes it very difficult for them. So if we're thinking about the victim here, we need to think about that cost. Um, a victim of domestic, uh, a domestic um, abuse whose abuser has not been convicted of the relevant offence wouldn't be helped by this amendment. Legal aid is complex, and I absolutely support uh, Mr. Frew when he has said that legal aid needs to be sorted out. This bill, unfortunately, won't do it as much as we do need it sorted out, but um, I think we need to work more on that and scope out the consequences of it, including any unintended consequences. Um, for instance, the victim may not be the only other per person who gets legal aid. Um, the Department of Justice already has the power to do some um, of this, so to do it in a slower time after engaging with stakeholders and scrutinising it properly um, would, would be the way forward. And I appreciate that Women's Aid and other groups have um, put their positions across. I'm one of many people that they've emailed. Um, however, I think we need to look at the unintended consequences of this, and that's why at this point I wouldn't be, I'd be supporting the Minister in opposing that new Clause 14. Um, there are ways that we need to help people, um, and I don't think that those, those two amendments are the way to do it. Um, I am delighted that this Group 2 is going to deal with parental alienation. Um, how many of us have men or women who are no longer able to um, have access to their children, where the children are used as a battering ram against them? Um, so, for instance, the new Clause 12 fantastic. It's the sort of thing that, that parents who do not live with their children who are being alienated from them do need. Um, so I welcome that part. As I said, I would be quick tonight, um, but thank you very much, Mr. Spe Deputy Speaker. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to Group 2 of, of our amendments tonight. Um, just in relation to I suppose the point first of all, both the Chair and the Minister referred to, to bullying in relation to their comments on this section and this is anti-bullying week and think that we should acknowledge that in the Chamber tonight. And 
I mean, we don't need to go into all the detail. We've heard it on many, many occasions on this, the floor of this assembly, the impact that bullying has. And domestic abuse and coercive control is bullying and by another name. So just to make that point, but also to remind members, this is anti-bullying week. We should speak out. We should make people aware of it at every opportunity and aware of the fact that we will do what we can. And I think that this legislation is part of that. So, amendments 9 and 11, the Chair has already outlined what the purpose and intention of these, these are, and it's, it's in relation to change in the 18 to 16. And this is not a perfect solution, as Sinead Bradley has already outlined. However, in fairness to the Minister, it would fall outside the scope of this bill to deal with it in, in a more rounded manner and actually outside the competency of her department. It needs, it's something that needs to be done in conjunction with the health department. So I think that the minister, along with her colleague in the health department, Robin Swan, have come up with the most suitable solution, not a perfect solution, but the law is very rarely perfect. And that leads me on to some of my other comments. We won't. We want to get the best legislation possible. We've made that clear. I don't think there's one member in this House or the Minister or any of the officials or committee staff who've worked on this who don't want to see the best legislation. But it won't be perfect. It just won't be. And that, we have to accept that now. And Mr Frew has already said we may have to come back to it. I hope we don't have to come back to it too soon. And I think in further, um, further parts of our comments when we talk to the reporting and the oversight, we'll probably talk to more of that about the importance of that in relation to well, if we do have to come back to it, that we're coming back to it based on good information and good quality information, and that's why those amendments, when we talk to them later on, will be so important. The Minister's Amendment 12, we will also be supporting. It's a very welcome introduction to the Bill in, in relation to the meaning of ill treatment. Amendment 13 is the committee amendment, and that is around the, order, the domestic abuse, protection, orders and notices. And whilst I accept and take on board all of what the Minister has said and indeed have sympathy to what the Minister is saying and to how difficult and challenging a job her department has and, and she has in doing, we as a committee really felt this was too important not to have on the face of the bill. And one of the issues that I personally raised at the, at the beginning of our consideration stage as a committee of this bill was around non-molestation orders and the difficulties around them and the difficulties that people seem to have accessing them. And then whenever they, they do get a non-molestation order, within weeks they're back in court again and the non-molestation order is removed. So really my issue around the protection notice and orders were in the hope that they might give some relief to victims. And I would hope that that is what will be delivered by these. And I would urge the Minister to bring this forward, and she has already highlighted that she is going to bring it forward in the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, and I absolutely welcome that intent. And I think that if it is brought forward in the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, then that will resolve all our issues, because we have concerns also that it may not serve the purpose that I want it to serve and that the committee wants it to serve. So we look forward to seeing what will come forward. However, I will be supporting the committee amendment tonight. Amendment 14, and I have concerns about this and I've raised them with Rachel Woods. And to be honest with you, I've probably been back and forth on this one with different members, including Rachel, with members of her own party. I've spoken to other parties. I am, I've listened to what the Minister has to say and, again, have a lot of sympathy for what the Minister is saying in relation to this. My main issue with it is, as Mr Frew has outlined, I actually don't think it goes far enough. I don't think it would serve the purpose that I actually want it to serve, much like the, the orders and notices. I have a fear around that as well. But this, I really am concerned, doesn't go far enough. And I think, to be fair to, to Ms Woods, she would accept that she would have liked to have went further. And I agree with the Minister 
that it needs to be dealt with in the round. However, in the absence of something else, in the absence of something better, then I feel we have to support it. So we will be supporting it here tonight. We will be supporting Amendment 14. I would certainly welcome discussions with the Minister around this issue, as I'm sure would other committee members. And I don't doubt the Minister's sincerity when she says this is an issue she wants to deal with in the round, because it does go much deeper. But as we stand at this moment in time, we do have, and, and it's very often it's the working poor, it's the people that, that other members have already talked about. And even when, when Paul Frew spoke to, to the cost of being £2,900, it might as well for some people be £2 million. Because if you haven't got it, you haven't got it, it doesn't matter how much it is. And I can certainly speak from experience in that regard. Not on this issue, not, not to legal cases, but I certainly know many, many people, my own family included, and, and people who I care about, who have been in this situation. But I can certainly speak to, if you haven't got money, it doesn't matter if it's £30 or 300000 You don't have it, and that's it. So that is, a re that is a real issue. Our hope as a committee, and we probably, in fairness, would have liked to have had more time to scope this out and to, to delve further into it. But I did raise with the officials on Thursday that we would be open to amendments at further consideration stage if it's going to improve this. And we certainly, as I've already outlined, would be open to having that conversation with the Minister to actually address it, because I think the threshold for people to access it is probably going to be too high. It's, it's similar, from my understanding and by what Ms Woods told me, it's similar to accessing the help in relation to non-molestation orders, and I've already outlined that that's a challenge for people. So I think the threshold probably is too high. The one effect that we are hoping that it might have is that if people think that their partner or ex-partner or that other person is going to have access to legal aid, it may well prevent them from taking them back to court continuously, because they do do it as a further means of abuse. It's financial abuse and it's mental. I, will, yes. I thank the member for giving way, and she addresses the point acutely as to the, the crisis that many of these working per face. And, and would she agree with me that it is an absolute courage and testament to those people that, albeit the lure for financial aid via legal aid, is there in relation to quit their work and, and uh, become unemployed and therefore follow down the legal aid route, that the courage of those individuals to, <coughs> to want to have the ability to break free from the coercive control by controlling their own lives, by controlling their own family budgets, and the fact being that they cannot access fair and adequate treatment by the state in relation to legal aid, while the, those coercive partners try to take them to the courts, to take everything that they hold dear from them. I absolutely agree, and as the Minister has already outlined, she, she's open to the argument that we're, we're pushing at an open door. So I do hope that we will have a fuller discussion around this, but I absolutely agree. And there's no doubt there are also those who have had to say, I'm going to have to give up my job. I'm going to have to go on to benefits. That's the only way I'm going to protect myself, my family, my children. So we know that that happens. So there is a cost somewhere. There's a cost to the public purse somewhere along the line whenever we push people to that stage. So that is our position at this moment on Group 2. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, seem to be rising quite a lot with a lot of people needing me to clarify things so hopefully I will be able to do that but I do want to speak initially to the amendments laid by the Minister that deal with necessary changes to legislation residing in the Department regarding the child cruelty offence and also the issue of parental responsibility. Just making some comments um, in the hope that further work can be carried out to fill in the cracks that have been uncovered by this as others have stated. In response to my concerned re concerns raised by organisations around parental responsibility exclusion, the department stated that it had been given careful consideration to the scope of the offence in order to ensure that children could be captured within it in their own right, where they were in a relationship with a family member. It was indicated that having considered the matter further and taking account of the concerns expressed, the minister was going to table this amendment to make it explicit that whereas a child is entreated, it would also include non-physical abuse, and I welcome that. 
But discussions on this and how it interacts with parental responsibility exclusion in the Bill raises some important issues, essentially due to the fact that the legislation that covered child protection and the child cruelty offence only applies to those under the age of 16. So amendments to clauses 11 and 17 therefore had to be tabled to ensure that non-physical abuse of 16 and 17 year olds in a parent-child relationship is clearly provided for and to ensure that there was no gap. But it did expo expose clear differences between these two pieces of legislation constituting an offence. The abuse committed against a 14 year old as opposed to a 17 year old carries different consequences. The amendments in question 9 and 11, whilst I understand are necessary right now, do not address these differences that have been identified. In fact, they now create an arbitrary distinction between children of different ages and mean that abusive behaviour receives different maximum sentencing depending on age. And this concern was brought to the committee through the process by children's organisations, including NSPCC and NICI. And I fully recognise and support them in seeking to resolve this. The Department has stated that no other jurisdiction locally provides for criminalisation in re relation to parental responsibility under domestic abuse legislation and the provisions in the Bill in relation to the offence and children go further than others already provide for. Nevertheless, I agree with the view that there should be no such arbitrary distinction in legislative protection and sentencing ceiling simply based on age. And that's why I raised the possibility of introducing an equivalency in the maximum penalty across the two offences. And officials responded to say it wasn't possible to do in this bill, given it was a matter for the Department of Health. And even through the Amendment 12 that changes the child cruelty offence, it's also a matter for the Department of Health. So I hope that the Minister can work with executive colleagues to look at this matter. And I would also encourage the Health Committee to gather the relevant evidence to consider any possible solutions. With regard to Amendment 12, strengthening the child cruelty offence to amend the definition of ill treatment, I also welcome. So I will turn now to Amendment 14 and the need to help victims and survivors of abuse with regard to family proceedings. And again, Mr Frew has set it out and we're going to have to stop making a habit of this. And I'm sure that this will come soon, no doubt, or is that possibly tempting fate? The issue was first raised in the committee on the 17th of September during the informal deliberations where Mr Frew said, the other piece is about using the court itself as a weapon. You have the scenario where one parent gets legal aid and the other does not. The parent with legal aid goes to court all the time and it drains the resources of the other parent who sometimes has responsibility for the child. It drains the family assets or savings. There is a potential conflict around access to justice, which we have to be mindful of. But I think that something needs to be put in here. I'm not convinced yet that the family proceedings and the other bits cover it all. I do not believe that it does. For me, the struggle is trying to get something that I have in my head down on paper, but we need to do something. I totally agree. We do need to do something to address this, and that's why I've tabled this amendment. At the time, I did ask the committee if access to legal aid was something that we could look at, but I recognise the sheer amount of issues not covered in the bill that we explored and deliberated on somewhere along the lines. This one was overshadowed by focus on working out potential improvements that would definitely fall within the bill's scope. I also recognise that there may not have been the appropriate political census for me to try and push the issue further through the committee's work, and that is why I came to table the amendment on my own. Returning to the very brief discussion that we had on the 17th of September, I first of all want to elaborate on the main problem that the amendment seeks to resolve and the issue of perpetrators and former abusers exploiting the court system to further harm victims. In 2015, Women's Aid published research that looked at women's experience of the family court in Northern Ireland. They found that roughly one in five women did not have access to legal aid and that these respondents reported the cost of litigation as a deterrent to seeking court orders. Members be may be aware that the department introduced a waiver for financial eligibility limits for civil legal aid through regulations in 2015, which essentially means that those above the income and capital threshold who apply for non-molestation orders would still be eligible for legal aid. This was an important step and reflected that what Women's Aid were calling for at the time, namely the extension of the legal aid system to provide for free legal aid to women seeking protection orders. The study also identified significant wait times, women having to travel long distances to attend court and having to attend anything from six to ten times, particularly with child contact cases. Indeed, the vast majority of the women surveyed were in court in relation to child contact cases. 
This brings me to the amendment. The bill in its current form does not address all of these difficulties faced by victims in the justice system, and many issues remain around how the courts are used by former abusers and convicted perpetrators to further elicit harm and misery on survivors. But this amendment deals with one of the most common methods used by perpetrators to further the abuse, that is disputes over children and court proceedings relating to orders under the Children Northern Ireland Order 1995. The most common court orders made under this legislation are, of course, child contact orders, tools that are essential to protect children that have been living in a violent or abusive domestic situation. When such orders are made that place restrictions on access, visitation and residence with regard to former abusers, these can, of course, be appealed. That is the nature of our justice system. And it's important to reiterate that this amendment in no way interferes with the rights of citizens to appeal or challenge court decisions, nor does it tamper with the rights of appellants to seek legal aid. These two things remain unchanged. Nevertheless, there is a funda fundamental problem with the nature of some of these cases and indeed other types of proceedings more generally relating to court orders. That is where a perpetrator continuously and relentlessly challenges decisions made by the court or seeks other ways to heap further pressure and strain upon their former victim. This, and it should be recognised as a form of abuse in itself. It is a course of behaviour deeply damaging and on a psychological and emotional level for the survivor of the abuse. I will. Giving way. Part of the reason why this domestic abuse legislation is so important is because it will criminalise specifically that kind of behaviour which currently isn't captured under the existing law. Therefore, making the changes that are being proposed in terms of legal aid unnecessary, potentially, um, at this point, as well as uh, preemptory and without the proper research backup. I agree entirely with the member in terms of where she's coming from and how the system is abused, but I reiterate the point that judges already have the ability to rule such repeat um, applications to the court as vexatious and say that they will no longer be heard. I thank the Minister for her intervention and I, I welcome this and, and that's why I supported clauses 1 to 4 which does include this types of abuse and, but it doesn't address the point that I will get on to which is in terms of the financial aspects of this. And, also, if the, obviously the judicial system is there and it has that option, but it's clearly not being utilised enough, which brings me on to a further point that I'll make in Group 3 of the necessity of training. So I'm speaking here of court cases that are not optional or elective cases. In fact, if you speak to advocacy and support organisations such as Women's Aid or Victim Support, you will soon hear the extent to which some victims are dragged through the courts for no clear reason other than to further the abuse. You will read some personal stories and quotes from victims and survivors in the Women's Voices document submitted by Women's Aid to the committee in June. Here are some of the things that they've said. Judges need to recognise that the abuser is also using the court to abuse their partner. He's using the system to torture me. My ex had no interest in my daughter. By taking me to court, it was just another chapter in his game, which was to cripple me financially as it cost me to go, but, I'm not, but not him as he was unemployed. I had to go several times, but he didn't turn up on several occasions. He thought this was funny. This caused me stress, anxiety, and put me into debt paying court fees. I would also ask members to consider the evidence provided by someone that I will call Joanne to protect her identity at one of the informal meetings. I'll quote her here directly from the record. Joanne had a very poor experience at the family courts. She's been very nervous in being in the same building as the perpetrator and states that being in the same building as someone who has so much control over you can have an effect on the quality of evidence that you give. Her ex has just, just has to give her one of his looks to make her nervous and he has done this whenever she has been given evidence. She and her eldest child describe it as a look that still makes them want to run and hide. With regard to evidence of abuse, she was told that the judge wouldn't want to hear her details of abusive text messages and was told that financial abuse was not relevant to her case. She said that victims can be told what they feel is important is of no relevance. On an occasion in child contact proceedings, Joanne was told that her evidence regarding domestic abuse, which included details of rape and other abuse, was not relevant to the case and wasn't proven. When supervised access was discussed, Joanne said that she would ask her child, who was then 12, how she would feel about it. However, the judge called her an irresponsible parent 
and was told that she would be required to ensure contact. The child's view doesn't matter, despite them having witnessed traumatic incidents. She feels if you try and keep your children safe with withholding contact, you're being a bad parent, but if they go and are subjected to abuse, you're a bad parent for not protecting your children. Joanne's ex has taken three cases to the family court, which he subsequently dropped. He gets legal aid, but Joanne isn't eligible as she works. So she has to pay the legal expenses and childcare costs and take time off work. He went through the four, with the fourth case and was allowed unsupervised contact, but he hasn't gone ahead with the majority of contacts scheduled. Joanne can apply, apply to prohibit him from bringing any further orders against her to the family courts. Her solicitors are applying for, for two years, although their normal duration would be for one year, which means that she will face the same situation again and again, which adds to trauma. Joanne has other examples of cases of her ex has taken against her, which are without merit, and does not understand how he can continually able to be funded through legal aid to take these cases. She feels that in, it's in the interest of solicitors who take the cases to prolong them. Joanne said that in her view, the costs to her, it would be in her interests for cases to conclude more quickly, but she's so concerned for the well-being of her children that she will fight them. She feels like there is enough evidence to show that, she is, that he is using the court system to further the abuse, but his parental rights seem to trump everything that is not good for the child. Members, Joanne's experiences and those of other victims and survivors have no, with no access to legal aid, but their former abusers do, is completely abhorrent. I believe that it is totally unacceptable that anyone should have to endure this. As one support organisation expressed to my re researcher, they're being bled dry which puts an enormous strain on their mental and physical health, their ability to care and provide for their children, not to mention revisiting all of the trauma and having to see and be present with their former abuser in a court setting. I also have friends who have had this situation and for 10 years have had to listen to a close friend of mine who has literally been dragged through the courts and being bled financially dry so much she had to give her job up. I also want to thank, and I'll again refer to Hannah, not a real name, who contacted me yesterday. For getting, and I thank you for getting in touch with me recently. It's devastating to hear what some victims and survivors have had to endure, and her story is very similar to the one I've just outlined. We cannot stand by and allow this to continue. It is an awful, tragic ordeal that no victim or survivor who has done everything that they can to leave an abusive situation should have to endure. Many of them will have to take time off work to attend court or pay childcare. As legal costs for their solicitor pile up and up, the strain on their finances, their means to provide for their children get more and more squeezed. This amendment would go some way to remedy this injustice and help prevent this from happening to allow victims to access this legal aid. And I, I will. Uh, Member for, for giving way. And, and I thought, if I could, please, because actually you, you've made some really important points, but I just want to add a bit of balance because as you're speaking and as we're speaking, I'm getting emails about the very subject that we're talking about. And this is from a man, because it's not all women. It's men too, and we sometimes forget about that. And this uh, man who's just emailed me was given custody of his children three years ago and has never been allowed to have access to them. Why? Because his ex-partner has used the legal aid system to take it to court to keep them away from him. And he's had to fight that. And he's just said in the email to me now, and his, his words are, and now it's too late. The kids, kids are now that old. It makes no point fighting on with it. So I can uh, fully appreciate the point you're making. I just want to put balance to that, that men are suffering this. Maybe not as much, but men are suffering exactly the same. And I thank the member for his intervention and rest assured there's absolutely no distinction here between men and women with this uh, amendment. This is a victims focused amendment and this bill should also be victims focused. But I have already mentioned the Director of Legal Aid Services can disapply financial eligibility rules for victims of abuse in the case of non molestation orders under Article 10 of the 2015 regulations but there's no such help or support when it comes to child orders. That means that victims and survivors of abuse with sometimes modest incomes or savings are falling outside the financial eligibility limits and have no recourse to legal aid. The system as it currently sits is effectively saying to victims, we'll provide you with financial support to obtain a non-mall, but you can't receive any financial help for child dispute cases if you fall outside the financial limits. These limits currently stand at any disposable earnings over £234 per week and disposable capital of over three grand for the lower courts. So we're not talking about people missing out because they've got a lot of money. 
And I do, uh, maybe we go off a little bit, I do um, appreciate that this might be a catalyst for further reform, and I do welcome that. And I did raise this at committee, but what, on pa what if on paper you look as if you're loaded? So let's say it looks as if you've got thousands in the bank, but you don't, because your finances are being controlled by your abuser. So yes, more than happy to look at expanding this to take into account the reality of financial abuse, which is outlined in this offence. And then on to another aspect of the comments in relation to contribution of costs. This misses the point, and it has been addressed. Abusers often leave or refuse work in order to financially abuse, abuse and bankrupt victims through the court service. So we're not talking about people with a lot of money. We're talking about victims and survivors who may be teachers, nurses, admin staff and hospitality staff. Depending on their circumstances, earnings and savings, this could mean that they're not eligible for legal aid and all the while their abuser keeps bringing them to court, the legal fees continue while their financial and psychological harm continues. This amendment would grant victims the right to access legal aid and take away some of the burden of what they're going through. I recognise that the amendment does not and cannot address the entire issue but it will go some way to help victims and survivors. It would give the Director of Legal Aid Services discretion to disapply the financial eligibility rules for civil legal aid where the client is a victim of abuse and involved in court proceedings relating, relating to the child disputes, which is exactly what happens currently when a victim requires a non-molestation order for their protection. Members, it already exists. It's not new. Many survivors are vulnerable, single parents with modest incomes and mouths to feed, whose job or occupation means that they fall outside what is currently deemed to be eligible. And it's not right that former abusers can use the courts to drain their finances and re-traumatise them. So I believe this amendment will go some way to providing the help and support and access to justice that they deserve. And I understand that some members will have concerns around the cost and who the waiver will apply to, or put simply, how you define a victim. Clearly, these are issues that will need further work, and in many respects, they are interlinked. And I would, of course, welcome much further engagement with the Minister and the Department and the Committee as to how these things can be clarified, should the amendment be made. I do believe these issues can be resolved, and I would urge members to consider the principle and the merit of this amendment. Firstly, on costs, I was extremely disappointed to hear the words double-figure millions last week. There was no rationale or basis given for this figure other than the fact that the waiver would be uncapped. I think guesstimates like this are unhelpful, but again, as Paul Frey pointed out at the time, if, it, if this really is the scale of the problem, then it actually strengthens the case to do something. I will. Um, given that the member has brought this proposal, could she give us her financial assessment of the likely costs? Thank the Minister for, for intervention, and no, I can't. Um, I have been trying to obtain calculations and figures from the Legal Services Agency that could be used to come up with more sensible estimates, and I am still waiting to hear back from them. Again, I would welcome the input and help from the Department and the Minister and the Committee bringing this back, further clarification at further consideration stage. I will. Would the member agree with me that every time the Committee raises the issue of legal aid and how we can control the budget? The Department repeatedly advised the Committee that this is a demand-led issue and therefore to have a fixed amount of money for the legal aid budget is not possible. So therefore what the Minister is asking the Member to do is equally applicable to the Minister. The, the, issue, the issue is not um, the same because, of course, it is a demand-led service. What the member is proposing is to add to the demand at the same time as the committee is asking for the demand to be reduced. You cannot present a fixed budget for something which is demand-led, um, but you can cap the demand. You can control the demand. I have no issue with the principle of this. I have said this over again tonight in the chamber, but what we are doing here is entering into a situation where we create additional demand, the extent of which is unknown and the cost of which is unknown. That is quite a risky strategy to take, given that the Finance Minister was clear that he agreed this bill on the basis that it did not incur additional costs. Can I go? Okay. Um, 
I thank the members and ministers for their intervention. I suppose to add to comment in terms of the demand-led service and adding to the demand. Yes, adding to the demand where it is needed for victims. And I don't believe I have ever personally asked for the Legal Aid Services Bill to be reduced. I think that's a different matter. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, access to justice is incredibly important everybody who needs to obtain it. But what we're talking about here is a level playing field. And if we are concerned about cost, hear this. That cost, if it's not on the department or in legal aid services, it's in the hands and the pockets of the victims. Now, I know where I would rather have that cost. Thank you. Chair, um, Mr. Yep. Go ahead. It is unfair, perhaps, to ask the member to give way. But on that issue of demand, isn't there an argument to be made that this perpetual habit of bringing the victim to the court, having this system in place, would actually diffuse that? So demand would essentially reduce, and costs that are being incurred at the court that shouldn't be would actually fall as well. But would it also be true to say? that nobody can truly put a figure on this at this stage, simply because we've never had a domestic abuse bill before. So how do we measure it? How do we measure the numbers that may come out of the woodwork, which we hope do, and we capture via this bill? Thank the members for their interventions. And just on um, Bradley's point, I think then that brings us into group three of the importance of reporting and having adequate data on the functioning of this legislation. So one of the things that we're trying to get is the numbers of the current uptake of the waiver in relation to non-malls. And interestingly, um, my researcher has been absolutely fundamental to this, and I do have to put on record my thanks. Could not be standing here today without him. He has spoken to on the take-up of non-malls is not what it could be. So I'd possibly ask the minister to comment on that. It's my understanding that legal services agency are trying their best to spread awareness and boost take-up amongst solicitors. But there are clearly victim survivors out there who are not accessing this financial support when they could be for protection orders. I would also point out that women's aid research that I mentioned earlier noted that 80% of women surveyed in the family courts were receiving legal aid. The study is outdated, granted, and we do need more up-to-date figures. But if we are to assume that about one in five of abuse victims who find themselves in the family courts in relation to child orders would benefit from the amendment to introduce this waiver, then I don't think we're talking about gigantic sums of money. I would also encourage members to reflect on the big difference that this could make to those victims and survivors who find themselves in that situation. I don't think you can put a price on preventing abuse, putting a stop to the awful scenario where victims are having finances drained through legal costs by the former abusing bruiser dragging them through the courts. And I understand that members may also have concerns about how a victim is defined for the purposes of applying this waiver, and the text of the amendment is quite open in this regard. In my view, it is important to be wary of how prescriptive it is, because that would have the potential to exclude. And the me members of the Justice Committee have had that argument put out to them in a number of things that they wanted to see in this bill. I pick up on what Mr. Frew said earlier on with regards to stalking, strangulation, and so on. We cannot be prescriptive. We had this argument about inserting coercive control as well, and that was an argument successfully made by the department. So I know that it's something that legal services agency would need clarity on in order to operate the waiver effectively, and I will continue to engage with them on further on that to ensure that it's practical. I note that this is also a power that is written into, by the department into this bill on section 11D with regard to future regulations on court proceedings. So it's already in that bill, that's under clause 26, it's the prohibition of cross-examination family proceedings with the department having a duty to bring forward regulations that specify what evidence of domestic abuse will be sufficient for the purposes of the court prohibiting, prohibiting cross-examination by the perpetrator. So in response to women's aid concerns about uh, as what specified offence will be, the Department have stated that regulations will not be drafted until the bill becomes legislation and will be consulted on. They also said that the types of evidence that might be specified include, for example, a letter from a health professional or from an organisation providing support services to victims of domestic abuse. 
MARAC, or the Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conference Programme, could also be used, just as an example. This is where a number of statutory bodies, like the PPS, Public Protection Unit and PSNI, use a victim-focused meeting to assess risk, identify a safety plan and can refer on. So I will be engaging with those groups, and if any changes or mo more detail is required, I believe that this can be done at further consideration stage. And it's the same argument of why I think it needs to go into to consideration stage now that Mr Given made on the interim protection for victims. Without it in the legislation, how will we be guaranteed that it will actually happen? I would encourage all members to support Amendment 14 at this stage. We must make, them, make this legislation victim-focused. Thank you. And I call the Minister to end on the, this group of amendments. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the members for the contributions that have been made. Amendment 12, as we stated earlier, um, is to make clear that non-physical ill-treatment of a child under 16 by someone with parental responsibility for them is an offence. Amendments 9 and 11 are linked, reducing the parental responsibility exclusion threshold from under 18 to under 16 in the context of the new offence, as well as the generic statutory aggravator. Together, these close a legislative gap by ensuring that non-physical behaviour of a child under 18 by someone with parental responsibility for them can be dealt with. I welcome the support for these changes and I concur that further work is needed in relation to this issue in the health sphere and further commitment, uh, further commit to working with uh, Minister Swan to support any such changes as he may wish to develop. Sinead Bradley um, raised the issue of the difference in offences and particular penalties um, that will occur as a result of the means by which we have included 16 and 17 year olds in this bill. For the domestic abuse offence provisions, this uh, will cover not only non-physical abusive behaviour, but could also uh, include serious violent and sexual assaults, which is reflected in the higher penalty of 14 years. Children under 16 are being dealt with under health, child protection legislation, and the penalties associated with this are a maximum of 10 years and have been in place for some time. As Justice Minister, I cannot alter this and any changes would have wider ramifications for the Department of Health who have the policy responsibility in this area and therefore it is appropriate um, that I allow the Health Minister to take this forward and will support him when it comes to the point where penalties are then being discussed. Turning then um, to the issue of Amendment 13. I will, yes. Apologies. Um, just before you moved on to Amendment 13, it was around the issue of health, and forgive me for intervening on you, I, I ran out of time to do it with the Chairman of the Health Committee. Um, I did thank the Health Committee at the start of proceedings for the work that they had done and the engagement uh, with the, the Committee, uh, which we did appreciate. And He raised an issue, Minister, around special paid leave, um, as well as the housing issue to do with the Department for Communities. That was an issue that the, the Committee did look at. It is in our report. And the department, the minister for the economy, has asked her officials to consider the issue of special paid leave in respect of this issue and other employment issues, and where provision can be made and consensus reached with the executive, a suitable legislative vehicle would be taken forward. So it was just minister to address that issue to, to the chair of the health committee and to thank him and the committee for the work they had done with our committee. And I'm going to move on to those particular issues that um, Colin Gilder and you has raised um, in uh, his contribution. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, given that it has now um, been addressed, it may be worth me doing so now. Um, the issues here that we are having to address do span more than just the Justice Department. Um, and so there were a number of issues that were raised and indeed were touched upon this evening, um, which extend beyond the responsibilities of the Department of Justice. However, I did not leave those issues simply um, to gain um, to, to, to gather dust on the shelf. Um, I wrote to Minister Dodds um, because she is, as you know, taking a review, forward a review um, of statutory leave provisions. And I've asked her to look into this as part of her review in terms of developing um, new employment law. Further, in respect of housing, Minister Nicholin has, as you rightly say, um, said that she will look at the issue um, with respect to housing um, and availability of shelter accommodation because it falls for the Department of Communities to do so. And I'm happy to work with her in that regard. However, it is also the case, and it needs to be stressed again because it's often forgotten, Mr Speaker, that there is already good work being done in this field. And it should not be the automatic assumption that where someone is subject to domestic abuse or domestic violence, that they should have to flee their home. 
There is already provision in place for someone to be excluded from the home if they are a domestic abuser and under um, the Safe Places um, work that is done with the Department for Community um, and with my colleagues across the executive to allow people to create a safe space within their home um, so that they're able to remain in their own home, in their own community, with the benefit of having um, the social contact and support that they need and that it is the abuser who is asked to leave the home um, made to stay away from the home um, and allow the family um, to continue because the, the moving of um, those who are um, subject to abuse has serious uh, ramifications, for example, for children and their schooling. And so there is a genuine challenge around how we actually deal with this issue. So it is important that we don't presume um, in favour of it having to be um, the person who is abused, the abused party, that have to leave the family home. Turning, as I said, to Amendment 13 then, um, I intend to bring forward detailed primary legislation to uh, provide for domestic abuse protection notices and orders, and therefore I would resist the committee amendment for that reason. It places an unnecessary risk on my department in stipulating a restrictive two-year time period. I'm hugely sympathetic, I have to say, um, to the views of the committee when it comes to this matter, and I've been clear in my intention that I want to do this under the future miscellaneous provisions bill, and I consider this amendment unnecessary, and the rest of my department is great. I have sought permission of the executive to add the domestic abuse protection notices and orders um, into the miscellaneous provisions bill explicitly stating that a restrictive two-year time frame for the introduction of an untested policy, which has not yet been subject to public consultation, leaves my department expo exposed to a successful judicial review and unnecessary levels of risk, including financial risk, which would not only impact on the Department of Justice but on all ministers, because it is ultimately for the executive to bear those risks. Including provision in this bill does not enable the detail of the provisions to be set out in primary legislation, ahead of which necessary consultation must be undertaken. The committee are understandably, and a number of members have referred to it, concerned at why the domestic um, violence protection orders and notices were not progressed. The first thing is that it could not happen during suspension of the Assembly. So there's three of the years that are taken out of the mix. When the Assembly was restored, I sat down with officials to look at what needed to be done to introduce them. However, by that point, we were aware, through operational experience gained in England and Wales, that there were considerable problems with the operation of the notices and orders, and they were going to be superseded by domestic abuse protection notices and orders in the new domestic abuse bill. It therefore seemed to me to be a waste of resource in the department to bring forward the domestic uh, the domestic violence protection notices and orders when, as part of my programme of work um, in the department, I intend to bring forward the new and improved domestic abuse protection orders and notices. So it wasn't that we simply decided as a department not to bother, as seems to have been insinuated by some in the debate today. There was good reason why the department did not bring these things forward, despite the fact that they were allowed for in previous legislation. The detail of this policy is currently being discussed with voluntary and community sector partners, and I would therefore hope to be in a position to consult shortly on my policy proposals. As explained, however, given the timings of that consultation and the introduction date for the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, which will be an expansive piece of legislation and will take a considerable time to pass through this House, these measures will be brought forward instead as amendments ahead of the consideration stage of that bill. This is going to take time in order for us to be able um, to get the bill through um, the Assembly. We also have pressure on the Office of Legislative Council in terms of the drafting of this legislation and all of the other legislative pressures which will come in this time. And so by bringing forward this as an amendment, it will allow us to do the full policy development that is required and then amend the miscellaneous provisions bill. But I have said that I am happy to bring that, those amendments forward so that they may not be on the face of the bill as introduced, but they will be available to the committee in order to be able to take evidence and to work with us in terms of developing them. I welcome, despite our disagreement on how to proceed at this juncture, that the Justice Committee and the Chairman have indicated that they are supportive of development and progression of these measures in due course. I believe that primary legislation is the right place um, for that to preside. 
It will not be possible, as I have explained, to have formal committee scrutiny of the provisions on those notices to the same extent that would normally be possible. But I will take whatever steps are necessary in order to ensure that the committee has the opportunity to consider and comment on those draft clauses ahead of them then being brought to the House for consideration um, as part of the consideration stage. The inclusion in primary legislation will mean that there is also executive oversight of the policy proposals and the draft amendments. This House, crucially, will also have the opportunity to debate the details of those provisions during the amending stages of the Assembly legislative process, both at consideration and further consideration stage. While that might not be as fulsome as it is usual, it is certainly better than being relegated to a short clause in this bill, and it will be enhanced greatly by the public consultation which we are intending to take forward. In fact, um, in his contribution, Sean Lynch rightly highlighted the need for further contribution and policy development in this area, yet has indicated that he is supporting a means of going forward to proceed to secondary legislation at this stage without either being in place. Members have again said that they do not understand why the Department um, will not be able to deliver regulations on protections uh, within two years. It is simply not feasible for my department to work on bringing forward detailed and extensive primary legislation, the size of a medium bill, while at the same time progressing with regulations on the same issue. And that is the duty which this clause will place on the department. We simply do not have the resources to do the job twice in two different ways. And if we allocate resources to that, they will be taken from elsewhere, in, in particular and from the frontline work we do in terms of domestic abuse and support for victims. If we are going to be victim-centred, then we need those officials in my department who lead on this to be focused on that and not replicating work uh, with nugatory effect. Provision through primary legislation is, as I have said, a more appropriate um, vehicle for change of this nature. Turning then um, to the issue of um, Amendment 14. And for that reason, Mr Speaker, I will not support the amendment. Um, in, in the case of Amendment 14, this is a technical change to the rules around financial eligibility for legal aid. It is well intentioned. There is no one in the House tonight who does not believe that this is an area that needs to be looked at and developed. However, by acting with this haste, we will lose the opportunity to undertake the research and engagement that would result in stronger proposals whose impact we better understand. We also reduce the ability to evaluate, review and, if necessary, amend the provisions to ensure their effective operation and practice, which is gained from the committee taking this away and looking at it with me in terms of secondary legislation. There is a place for secondary legislation. This is precisely such a place. But to place these duties on the face of primary legislation will create significant difficulties for the Legal Services Agency and for the Department. The potential cost of this Amendment 14 is unqualified. It could be many millions of pounds annually without clarity, and we will not be able to say that we can afford the protection that it will afford the protection that is required. So it is not only potentially expensive, um, but and uncosted, which is not the way we should be doing business in this House. But it is also not necessarily going to give the protection which some members seem to believe that it will. There, we need to make sure the proposals that come here are effective and affordable. The Department of Finance approved this bill on the basis that it would not require additional resources. The Minister for Finance could not have been clearer about that matter. The passage of Amendment 14 drives a coach and horses through that, and that will have implications for every other minister in the executive, from whom money will have to be taken in order to fund this. It also flies in the face of the committee's own demands that the cost of legal aid needs to be reduced and brought under control by introducing uncosted and uncapped demand into the system. So this is a serious matter in conflict with what has been said all along. The costs about which we are concerned, and many members have said if they're not carried by the department and the legal services agency, then they'll be carried by someone else. The costs that we are concerned about are not just a reflection solely of the scale of the problem, but of the poor framing of the amendment and the fact that it may not be sufficiently targeted in order to deliver the results that people would wish. And the amendment will not, despite its expense, 
as some seem to believe, stop someone's financial resources from being drained by repeated court actions. If you have capital of more than £3,000, you'll still have to pay a contribution amounting to the whole cost of proceedings in the higher courts. The waiver does not help that person at all. With respect to Sinead Bradley's point, and I, I understand where she is coming from, but she assumes that the only reason that people will drag partners through the courts is to financially damage their partner. That is not true. People will drag their partners through the courts even where there is no financial detriment because they use it as another means to exert control and fear um, through, and anxiety on, uh, on their partner. It is another form of abuse. So to suggest that by removing the financial incentive we will remove the behaviour is, an, is simply not coherent. They will continue to do this. I'm going to draw this to a close. They will continue to do this. And what we need to do and what we are trying to do in this bill as a whole is capture that kind of abusive behaviour so that the dragging of people back to court in itself becomes an offence, therefore placing more pressure on the judiciary to exercise the law that they already have to hand, which is to rule against bringing people repeatedly back into the court system. And they have the capacity to do that. Mr Speaker, I believe that, this, that the issue of um, the, no, uh, the Amendment 14 is one that I cannot in good conscience as a member of the executive with my responsibilities and duties to other members and departments stand over. I am absolutely agreed when it comes to the issue of needing to do legal aid reform. And I would remind Paul Frew, who said that there is a need for legal aid reform to be reviewed, that actually my predecessor did tackle legal aid. It wasn't too big or too painful or too difficult for Minister Ford. He took it on, and I'm happy to take it on, via the correct vehicle. And this is not that vehicle. This is not a bill for legal aid reform. This is a bill to deal with domestic abuse. By developing secondary legislation rather than primary legislation, we can ensure that the issues are addressed correctly with due diligence, but also ensuring that it actually captures what members want to achieve and that we can refine it in light of the experience that we have in the courts when we introduce such changes. For that reason, I will not support Amendment 14. And I would ask members to think carefully before doing so, because once it is on the face of the bill, it will not be able to be changed or reduced in terms of the onus that it places on the department at further consideration stage. The duties on the department can only be increased at further consideration stage. And so I would ask members to think very carefully about how they vote on this bill. That concludes uh, my remarks on this section. Okay, members, thank you. Um, I mean, that concludes that debate. Uh, moving on now, Amendment 9 has been proposed. An amendment proposed to clause 11, page 7, line 15, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 9 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 11, as amended, stand part. The question is that clause 11, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 12. No amendments have been tabled to Clause 12, but it's the Chair of the Committee for Health, Mr Callum Gildernew, has indicated a wish to speak to the Clause stand part, and I call Callum Gildernew. Uh, before the question is put on Clause 12 stand part, I would like to put two questions uh, to you, Minister, based on stakeholder concerns raised with the Health Committee. First, uh, could you outline the safeguards in place to protect victims with mental health conditions from inappropriate use of this defence? And secondly, if you have any plans to review the operation of this clause. Will the Minister to respond, please? Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, with respect to the issue of capability, it is something that the Department has considered um, in respect to um, the abuse of the uh, reasonable person defence. 
However, that would be one of the considerations that the reasonable person test would take into account. So in the same way that it means that, for example, controlling someone's finances um, because, um, for example, denying children um, their pocket money or their access to their um, digital devices would not be captured by this offence. In the same way, um, someone who is using um, and taking care of someone else's money for reasons of incapacity of the victim, um, or the, the proposed victim in that case, would be captured by the reasonable person defence. Um, with respect to the second part of the question about review, it would be intended that all of the bill would be open to both report and review throughout its operations. I think it's important we'll get to the reporting on the next stage, but that is something that is hugely important. And I certainly believe that there is a role for the Department of Health and the Health Committee um, in terms of the review of this bill, um, in terms of feeding into our response um, and any changes that may be ne necessary uh, once the bill is in operation. Thank you. And the question is that Clause 12 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 10 has already been debated. I call the Minister of Justice to move formally. Amendment 10. Uh, beg to move. Amendment proposed to Clause 13, page 7, line 40. Insert words on the, as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 10 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that Clause 13 is amended. Stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 14. Uh, no amendments have been tabled to cl Clause 14. The question is that Clause 14 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to Clause 15. The question is that Clause 15 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Sorry. Clause. No amendments have been tabled to Clause 16. The question is: the Clause 16 stand part of the bill? All those in favour say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 11 has already been debated. I call the Minister of Justice to move formally Amendment 11. Moved. Thank you. Amendment. Proposed to clause 17, page 9, 11, line 21, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 11 be made. All those in favour say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clause 17 as amended stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. No amendments to have been tabled to clauses 18 to 20. I propose by leave of the Assembly to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that the clauses 18 to 20 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 12 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally Amendment 12. I beg to move. Amendment proposed before clause 21 insert new clause meaning of ill treatment etc in offence provision question is that amendment 12 be made and a new clause added to the bill all those in favour say aye. aye the country no the ayes have it no amendments have been tabled to clause 21 to 24 and i propose by leave of the assembly to group these clauses for the question on stand part the question is that clauses 21 to 24 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. The country no. The ayes have it. Amendment 13 has already been debated. I call the chairperson of the Committee for Justice, Paul Given, to move formally Amendment 13. Moved. The amendment proposed after clause 24 insert new clause interim protection for the victim. The question is that Amendment 13 be made and a new clause added to the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. 
I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. Amendment 14 has already been debated, and I call Ms. Rachel Woods to move formally Amendment 14. So moved. Amendment proposed after Clause 24 insert new clause amendment to the eligibility requirement for civil legal aid. Question is that Amendment 14 be made and the new clause added to the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. No. Aye. No. Aye. no. We call the division. So we'll clear the lobbies. The House will divide. Okay, members and members, please reassume your seats. Okay, members. Right, members. Before I put the question, members, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we can avoid a division. The question is that the, the question is that Amendment 14 be made and the new clause added to the bill be agreed. All those in favour, say aye. Contrary, no. No. Okay. Do we have tellers? Order, order, members. Do we have tellers? Okay, members. Thank you. Member tellers have been appointed as follows: tellers for the eyes, Rachel Woods and Paul Frew; tellers for the nose. Or Kelly Armstrong and Chris Little. Now, before the Assembly divides, I wanted just to remind people that, per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I also remind you to ensure that social distancing continues to be observed while the division is taking place. Please be patient at all times and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Uh, clear lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Okay, members. Members resume their other seats. And uh, clerk, please read the result. Fifty-one members voted. Forty-four members voted aye. Seven members voted no. Twenty-five members who voted in both lobbies are not included in these results. Amendment 14 is made and the new clause added to the bill. Okay, members, Amendment 14 is made and the new clause is added to the bill. Uh, on fasten the doors, could I say, members, that that concludes then the debate on the Group 2 amendments? And uh, I now propose, by leave of the Assembly, to suspend the sitting until 10.25. 10 the sitting is by leave suspended. Thank you. Order members, we will now resume the, key, the consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. We have now come to the third group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 15, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 18 to 26. Uh, and I call the Minister of Justice to move Amendment 15 and to address the other amendments in the group. Not moved, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Not moved. <clears throat> I will call the chairperson of the Committee for Justice, Paul Given, to move Amendment 18 and to uh, convince the group th commence the Group th 3 debate in a moment. However, before this can happen, we must dispose of Amendments 16 and 17, which have already been debated. So Amendment 16 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to formally move Amendment 16. Back to move. <clears throat> amendment proposed to Clause 25, page 13, line 28. Leave out and insert words as printed on the marshalled list. The question is that Amendment 16 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 17 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to formally uh, move Amendment 17. Beg to move. Amendment, amendment proposed to Clause 25, page 13, line 30. 
leave out and insert the words as printed on the marshalled list. The question is that Amendment 17 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now return to the third group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 18, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 19 to 26. And I call the chairperson of the Committee for Justice, Paul Given, to move Amendment 18 and to address the other amendments in the group. I beg to move, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'll cover each of the committee amendments in this group uh, in turn. Uh, I know, members, the hour is late, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is the culmination of the committee's scrutiny process over several months, which I outlined in great detail at the start. Um, so we'll make no apology in, in giving proper justice in terms of this assembly continuing to carry out its role, and members have been doing that um, at length for some, but that's been necessary, uh, and I commend them for the way in which they so far have uh, carried themselves in this debate, going over this in great detail. Uh, and so, obviously, as chairman of the committee, I need to convey the wider issues that the committee has considered and try to reflect all of that. So my speeches necessarily have been longer than other members, uh, and indeed I'm doing that on behalf of uh, all of the parties where we've agreed on that, and that's why some members don't need to be as elaborate uh, as I have been. Um, but I do need to keep doing that, Mr Deputy Speaker, despite the hour being now 10.30, and this is into the seventh hour that the Assembly has now considered this. Uh, so I'll continue to proceed uh, and give the proper uh, deliberations that uh, is required. Beginning with Amendment 18, Deputy Speaker, the first time the committee became aware of Operation Encompass was when the Chief Constable gave oral evidence in February 2020. Not long after the committee was established, he stated that this was a programme operating in England and Wales that he was familiar with, and he wished to see it introduced in Northern Ireland. There were, however, legislative impediments that he hoped could be overcome with the support and assistance of the committee and other partners. When providing evidence to the committee on this uh, bill, a number of organisations also highlighted their support for the introduction of an Operation Encompass type approach in Northern Ireland, believing that it is complementary to the intentions of the bill and merits consideration give it, it, given that it ensures schools are in a better position to understand and be supportive of the child's needs and possible behaviours as a result of being notified where a domestic abuse incident has occurred the night before in which police have been called out. The provision of support within the school environment means the children are better safeguarded against the short, medium and long-term effects of domestic abuse. The Committee requested further information on Operation Encompass and the Department of Justice indicated that a multi-agency task and finish group was exploring how such an approach could be introduced locally, and the intention was to undertake a pilot project later in 2020. The Department also advised that both the Police and the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland were of the view that currently there was insufficient legislative cover to enable the sharing of information between the police and schools for well-being as, as opposed to child protection purposes and legislative change is needed to facilitate this. Given the absence of the necessary legislative cover, the pilot project would operate on a consent basis. The Department informed the Committee that, in its view, such legislative provision could not be provided within the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. The Chair of the South Eastern Area Domestic and Sexual Violence Partnership that covers the locality where the initiative uh, will be piloted subsequently informed the Committee that while the partnership is keen to have Operation Encompass rolled out in Northern Ireland and agreed to the pilot in the Down sector of Newry, Mourn and Down District Council area, there will be limitations as the pilot will operate on a consent, on a consent basis, so the PSNI will only be able to notify a school where there is concern for the well-being of the child if they have the consent of the victim to do so. The partnership believes that there may be fewer notifications made as a consequence, and the victim could be at greater risk if the perpetrator learns that they gave their consent for the notification to be made. 
The committee requested clarification of the legislative gap preventing the introduction of the scheme in Northern Ireland and how it could be addressed. The Department advised that as the purpose of the information sharing is to ensure child well-being and the delivery will be in an educational setting, it considered that this would be a matter for education as opposed to justice legislation, and discussions were therefore ongoing with officials in that department to determine the appropriate legislative vehicle for the changes. The department again reiterated uh, that, in its opinion, the required legislative provision in this area could not be provided for in this bill. The committee is very supportive of this type of information sharing scheme being available in Northern Ireland and believes that legislative provision to enable the PSNI to share information with the school on well-being grounds to support children in the context of domestic abuse should be provided at the earliest opportunity. The Safeguarding Board would welcome the necessary legislative provision being included in this bill, and the Education Authority also believes that inclusion of such provision would strengthen the bill. To provide the necessary legislative cover as soon as possible, the Committee decided to bring forward the amendment in front of the Assembly today. In light of the Committee's amendment, the Minister advised us that, while it was not yet clear that the Committee amendment would be deemed admissible, she was in agreement with the Committee that there is considerable merit in provision being made available to enable information to be shared for the purpose of an Operation Encompass approach. While she considered tabling an alternative uh, amendment to ensure that any provision is as robust as possible and fully provides for the necessary regulations to be brought forward, following further discussion uh, and assuming the committee amendment is made today, uh, the Minister now intends to bring forward such an amendment at further consideration stage. Uh, These will build on the wording of our amendment and provide increased detail and clarity to ensure the provision will fully meet the intended purpose. The Committee welcomes the approach now being adopted by the Minister and her support for our amendment today, and we will be happy to consider further amendments to improve it before the Bill completes its passage through the Assembly. I want to address now amendments 20, 21 and 24. The context of these amendments relates to the consistent theme running through the evidence received by the Committee on the Bill regarding the importance of how the legislation will be implemented. Many organisations and individuals expressed the view that the legislation would only be as good as its practical implementation, and that how the legislation is implemented is as important as what it covers. The Committee believes uh, that for this legislation, and in particular the new domestic abuse offence, to be effective and achieve the desired result of better protection and criminal justice outcomes for victims of domestic violence and abuse, getting the implementation right in terms of training for those involved in gathering evidence, prosecuting and enforcing the new law, monitoring and reporting on it, and increasing public awareness is crucial. The Committee has therefore brought forward amendments in relation to data collection, training and reporting. Whilst agreeing that raising public awareness and recognition of the new offence will be very important, and the Committee welcomes the work that the Department intends to undertake in this area, specific legislative provision is not required for this. The Committee has, however, included a requirement for the Department to report on the strategies to communicate the new offence to the public and victims as part of the reporting obligations on the operation of the new offence as part of Amendment 24. In terms of the specifics of Amendment 20, uh, which provides for the Department to issue guidance on the type of information and data required to be collected to fully and properly assess the operation of the new offence, the importance of strengthening data collection in relation to domestic abuse and violence both generally and specifically in relation to the implementation of the new legislation was highlighted by a number of organisations. The views outlined a range of gaps including the nature, extent and impact of domestic violence and abuse on each of the Section 75 equality groups and the lack of uh, disaggregated data by sex, gender, ethnicity, uh, disability, uh, age uh, in relation to children the need for data to track the journey of abuse investigations through the criminal justice system, including the number of initial reports, the number of case files referred to the Public Prosecution Service, how many reach the department stages uh, of the court process, or, or how many that reach the different stages of the court process, how many reach the prosecution stage, what the resulting remedy is, and how many involve repeat offences to enable an accurate assessment of how the legislation is working was also emphasised. 
The Department advised uh, the Committee that it recognised the importance of robust data and was reviewing how best to secure this in relation to the new offence with partner agencies as part of the operational arrangements. The Department also indicated that a range of information is already or will be available, such as the applications for protection orders, uh, the number of convictions and higher level information in relation to the length of processes, and police statistics branch currently published statistical data on domestic abuse crimes uh, disaggregated by uh, sex, gender, uh, ethnicity. Uh, Information on disability and sexual orientation is not currently available, though, but the PSNI has been in contact with the Equality Commission in relation to the issue of further data collection on Section 75 groups for all crimes. The Committee recognises the importance of the availability of robust data to enable the effectiveness of this legislation to be assessed. The data also needs to be consistent across the various criminal justice agencies, something that is not always available. Uh, to allow for tracking of cases and analysis at each stage of the process. To ensure this, the Committee has therefore brought forward Amendment 20 today and welcomes the Minister's support for it. Moving to Amendment 24, which places a requirement on the Department to report on the new offence. The amendment will require the Department to report on the operation of the new domestic abuse offence and the aggravating factors provided for in clauses 8, 9 and 15 of the Bill in a range of areas including the number of cases taken, the number of convictions, the average length of time uh, for cases, the experience, uh, experiences of witnesses, the provision of the guidance required by Clause 25 and the communication strategies implemented by the Department to raise public awareness of the new offence. The first report must be available no more than two years after the commencement of the legislation, and the report must be laid in the Northern Ireland Assembly and published. Further reports are required no later than every three years. The amendment aims to provide for the effectiveness of the legislation to be monitored and assessed in a transparent manner. The Committee did consider including a reporting requirement in relation to the Section 75 groups, but decided not to pursue this following advice that it may have taken our proposed amendment beyond the reasonable limits of the Bill's collective uh, purposes. The Committee is also conscious that, while wishing to place a reporting requirement on the Department, there is a need to consider what the criminal justice agencies can actually deliver in terms of figures and statistics to enable the Department to fulfil its reporting requirements. The Committee welcomes the Minister's acknowledgement uh, that there is merit in reporting on the operations of the uh, provisions of the Bill and her support for the Committee amendment today. Rather than having two amendments dealing with the same issue for the Assembly to consider, uh, the Committee appreciates the approach that the Minister has adopted by not bringing forward an alternative amendment and is happy to consider any amendments that the Minister wishes to bring forward at further consideration stage that will build on the intent and purpose of our amendment and refine some of the language uh, so that it more closely aligns with practice and criminal proceedings. I am sure the Minister will expand uh, on this whenever uh, she speaks in this debate. Rachel Woods has brought forward uh, two amendments to the Committee amendment to add additional reporting requirements. Uh, the Minister has advised the Committee uh, that she intends to support Amendment 26, but not Amendment 25, due to the Section 75 element, and I am sure the Minister will uh, elaborate on the reasons around that. While the Committee did not discuss these amendments, uh, I suspect that it would have no difficulty with supporting Amendment 26, which provides for reporting on the number of offences recorded within each police district, and which the PSNI has confirmed could be provided in relation to Amendment 25. The Minister did highlight to the Committee last week that the operational partners had indicated uh, that they do not have the capacity within their IT systems and reporting systems to provide that level of data, and to do so uh, would have substantial operational and financial implications and require major IT changes. Uh, amendment uh, 21 relates to the requirement uh, around training. Uh, the Committee has brought this forward to ensure appropriate and adequate training of relevant personnel uh, takes place. The Minister advised the Committee that she could not support our amendment regarding training, and she would be bringing forward an alternative amendment. Following discussions at last Thursday's Committee meeting, the Minister has now decided not to move Amendment 15. In relation to our amendment, the Committee agrees with the views of a wide range of organisations who stated 
that there is a need for comprehensive training for anyone involved in gathering evidence, prosecuting and enforcing the new law, and the legislation will only be effective if this takes place. The ability to investigate and prosecute this new offence will hinge on training of police first responders to recognise and identify the signs of psychological abuse and coercive and controlling behaviour, which is manipulative, subtle and often covert. It will be vital that appropriate evidence is gathered if full use is to be made of this new offence. <clears throat> A number of organisations recommended mandatory training for the PSNI and other criminal justice organisations involved in the prosecution and enforcement of the new offence, and that training should cover specific issues including the impact of domestic violence and abuse on women and children, a wider understanding of men as victims of domestic abuse, the particular needs of different groups of people, including LGBT and other marginalised and vulnerable groups, such as migrant victims, and the obligations to take appropriate action in suspected cases of domestic abuse affecting children. The PSNI has advised the Committee that it recognises that officer training on the definition of the new offence and examples of the behaviours it involves will be pivotal pivotal for the successful enforcement of the legislation and the Chief Constable, uh, when he attended the meeting of the Committee on 24 September, outlined that training was being developed in conjunction uh, with the Women's Aid Federation to familiarise frontline officers with what coercive and controlling behaviour looks like. The training, which will be a mixture of online and classroom-based training, will be rolled out from December, and uh, particular roles will also receive specialist training where required. The Public Prosecution Service has also outlined that it is considering the establishment of specialist domestic violence and abuse prosecutors. It is envisaged that these prosecutors will receive more intensive training in relation to coercive control and the identification of patterns of domestic abuse behaviours, and they will also act as the first point of contact for police to assist in providing prosecutorial advice and ensure all reasonable lines of inquiry are pursued to maximise the opportunities for bringing fair but robust prosecutions. During the committee stage of the bill, the Department outlined that discussions were being held with the Judicial Studies Board in terms of raising awareness among the judiciary of the new offence, and this included considering what lessons can be learned from other jurisdictions. The Department also advised the committee that it recognised the importance of training, but did not consider that a requirement for it needed to be placed in statute. The committee, however, views training for relevant personnel as crucial to the effective implementation of this legislation, given the new offence is a course of behaviour offence, which will require the exercise of judgment by the police when gathering evidence, and a clear understanding and recognition of the behaviours associated with non-physical abuse for others involved in the prosecution and enforcement of the new law. The committee therefore decided to bring forward Amendment 21, uh, which places a duty on the Department to ensure that sufficient and appropriate training is made available to allow for the effective operation of this legislation. The training is mandatory for all those involved in the disposal of domestic abuse cases in policing and criminal justice agencies and must be provided annually, and the Department must publish the uptake of training by each relevant organisation at the end of each annual reporting period, given the importance of this to the effective operation of the legislation. The Committee does uh, have some sympathy with the point that the Minister made to us in relation to it being more appropriate to place the duty um, for training on the PSNI and the PPS, respectively, in relation to their personnel rather than the Department during the discussions last Thursday. Uh, we would therefore be content to tidy up the wording of our amendment if it is made today to reflect this at further consideration stage. The Committee does not, however, accept that there is no need for the training to be mandatory, and that by requiring annual training that it could become a tick box exercise, and that this would place significant problems on the organisations from a capacity perspective, and those were points that were made by the Minister to the Committee last week. The Committee also questions the Minister's understanding that the PSNI currently does not undertake annual recurrent training in every area, with members aware of a range of training that it does provide annually. The Committee believes that annual training is an important requirement and making the training mandatory for all those involved in the disposal of domestic abuse cases in policing and criminal justice agencies, including 
the PSNI, the PPS and the Northern, Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service emphasises the crucial role the training will play in the implementation of this legislation and the new offence. I'm happy to give way to the Minister. Rather than hold this for my own um, speech later, just to clarify, the point that I was making was that they currently don't provide annual training for any particular offence. They, of course, have to provide some annual training um, specific to their operational needs, but they don't with respect to any other offence. And this could create a precedent, which means that new offences being introduced would then be subject to annual training, and that could be burdensome um, if it continues in perpetuity. Well, that neatly takes me on as I continue, because our amendment is drafted to ensure appropriate training is provided, but also to give flexibility for the organisations to deliver different tiers of training as appropriate, including initial training, annual refresher training, and specialist training for particular roles. It does not require the same level of training to be undertaken by every member of staff in every criminal justice agency. The framing of our amendment will also provide parameters against which the Northern Ireland Policing Board can hold the PSNI to account. So I would therefore ask the Assembly to support the committee amendment today. In respect of Amendment 23, uh, this provides for independent oversight of and reporting on the implementation of the legislation for a period of at least seven years. The committee sees great merit in providing for independent oversight of the implementation of this legislation for a period of time until it is fully vetted in. Independent input in this way will hold government to account and build confidence amongst the organisations supporting victims that the legislation is operating effectively. Such oversight could also provide valuable input, advice and assistance to the criminal justice organisations in relation to addressing any issues that do arise. Many of the organisations that provided evidence to the committee noted that the Westminster Domestic Abuse Bill includes provision for a domestic abuse commissioner and supported the call from the Women's Aid Federation for the introduction of such a commissioner in Northern Ireland. A wide-ranging role was envisaged for such a commissioner to include oversight and scrutiny of the implementation of this legislation. So while the committee had sympathy for the calls for the appointment of such a commissioner and did consider whether it should attempt to pursue this, following further consideration and discussion, we decided that the key issue was to provide for an independent oversight function in relation to the implementation of the legislation and have therefore brought forward Amendment 23. The Department can bring uh, the independent oversight function to an end after a period of seven years by regulations, by which time the new offence and the legislation more generally should be well bedded in and any issues or difficulties with its application should have been addressed. The Minister advised the Committee that she agrees with the need for oversight and scrutiny of how the new offence operates. In correspondence to the Committee at the beginning of November, the Minister indicated that she considered our amendment though, to be akin to a domestic abuse commissioner in all but name. Following our discussions, I hope that the Minister is now clear that that is not the intention of the amendment, but rather it is to create an independent oversight function. Victims of domestic abuse have waited a very long time, much too long, Mr Deputy Speaker, for this legislation, and we must ensure that there is confidence that it is being fully implemented and effectively, and any issues that arise are identified quickly and addressed properly. The Minister advised the Committee yesterday that she is now content to support this amendment, which she has indicated will, when taken with a range of other oversight and scrutiny arrangements, ensure that there is a robust consideration of how the offence is working in practice. I welcome the change in the Minister's position, and I would ask the Assembly to support this Committee amendment today. Finally, I just want to confirm uh, that the Committee supports Amendment 19 uh, brought forward by the Minister, which I covered uh, when I spoke in the debate on the Group 1 amendments and do not intend to revisit that particular issue. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, that concludes my remarks as Chairperson of the Justice Committee. My colleague, um, Paul Frew, is going to elaborate on these amendments uh, to give the particular DUP perspective in relation to each of them. Um, so I don't intend uh, to labour the point. Just to, to make a couple of uh, remarks, Operation Encompass was an issue that uh, was raised by members extensively. Uh, the Chief Constable raised this with the committee. Uh, Linda Dillon uh, raised this issue, uh, I think, at nearly every meeting uh, and pursued this uh, relentlessly um, with the committee's support to do that. 
And so I am pleased that this is an issue that we're going to be able to address by way of this amendment today. Ultimately, the committee decided that we needed to test whether the Speaker would rule this in or not, uh, and I was pleased that the Speaker ruled uh, it to be admissible. Ultimately, what that is about is where there is a case in a home and the child witnesses an event uh, or there is a dispute in the home and the police are called to that, it makes common sense that the police should have the ability to then inform the school the next day rather than a child coming in, maybe with no lunch, or maybe without having its homework completed, and the teacher unwittingly challenging the child for not having the homework done or not coming in with its lunch. The committee saw this as a very common sense approach that the police, where they decide to do it, should have the ability to pass that information on appropriately to the school authorities. There were issues raised in terms of GDPR and information sharing, and I'm pleased that this amendment, which will then be enhanced to further consideration stage, will put that into practice. That's just good common sense, and I'm pleased that the committee was able to identify this. In respect of the independent oversight, this was a particular issue that my party wanted to see included, because we knew the domestic abuse commissioner is included uh, at the legislation in Westminster, and we've received uh, significant representations about uh, that particular rule. However, we recognised that that was unlikely to be within uh, the purposes of this bill and was a, a wider uh, piece of legislation that would need to be taken forward. And so critical to that was having a form of independent oversight. And again, um, I am pleased that we are going to be able to get that because for this legislation to be effective, it needs to have that level of scrutiny uh, being applied to it. Uh, and that independent oversight can then make subsequent recommendations, and from that, that may flow a domestic abuse commissioner. And so that, that is something that still may well happen in due course, uh, but that independent oversight uh, will be important uh, that we provide that. So in respect of uh, the amendments that were brought forward by uh, Rachel Woods, uh, in respect of Amendment uh, 26, uh, in regards to gathering the data around the PSNI, um, we are minded to support that amendment. Um, I, I was persuaded by the Minister's evidence in respect of Amendment 25 in terms of collecting the information. Uh, I am very sympathetic to, to what Amendment uh, 25 is seeking to do, but it is important that we are satisfied that actually that is capable of being provided. I, I know the Minister may well touch on this. Uh, at a later point, so um, at this stage we are minded not to support on this occasion the amendment from Rachel Woods around Amendment 25, but if it can be addressed at further consideration stage, we are certainly open uh, to do that. And in respect of Amendment uh, 22 uh, that has been put forward, uh, again, uh, th this is in respect to the issue around uh, resources. Uh, and. I was again persuaded by the Department's position in respect of this uh, around whether or not this was necessary. Of course, I want to see uh, the uh, appropriate resources being provided to give effect to, to what we're trying to do, um, but at this stage we weren't convinced that it was necessary in respect of Amendment 22, and therefore, um, again, on this occasion, are not minded to support Amendment 22. The other amendments will be supporting, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Linda Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I don't intend to repeat much of what the, the Chair has already said, but I would like to thank the Minister for not moving Amendment 15. I think that that has been helpful to us this evening, and as the Chair has already outlined, we certainly would be open to working with the Minister in relation to an amendment at further consideration stage and actually believe that that would be again helpful to, to us in, in terms of making good legislation. And that at the end of the day sorry that at the end of the day is what we want to do here as I've already outlined earlier. I want to focus a little on amendment eighteen. As the Chair has said, this is something that I had raised repeatedly and that was because I had first heard of it at a meeting with the Safeguard, Safeguarding Board when I was a member of the Policing Board. 
and I wasn't really sure what it was, but it sounded good. So I asked them would they send me more information and could we have further conversations around what it was and how it worked so that I could explore the potential with the policing board about how it could actually be delivered. And I did so at every opportunity in the policing board and was repeatedly told that we couldn't deliver it because there were issues around GDPR and around information sharing. There was, and actually the words that were continuously used were there was a legislative gap. I had asked on numerous occasions what was the legislative gap so that we could hopefully address it and never got an answer to that. So I took the opportunity when the Chief Constable came to us, knowing that this piece of legislation was coming forward, to ask him about Operation Encompass and what was the legislative gap and could he tell us so we could hopefully incorporate it into this. I am delighted that the committee gave the support that they gave in terms of Operation Encompass because whilst it might seem a very small part of this bill, and in some ways that it is a very small part of it, and we were concerned that it wouldn't be found to be within scope because it does fall within another minister's responsibility also in terms of the education minister. The fact that it was found within scope and that we will now be able to deliver for children, and we've already outlined earlier in this debate how important it is that we look after children who are impacted by domestic abuse. And this is a really, really important element because when a child witnesses or is a victim of domestic abuse incident and they go into school the next morning, they may well not have slept all night. They may not have been in their own home. They may, as, as the chair has already outlined, not have their homework done, not have their lunch. And teachers will challenge them because that's what they do when young people at school have not done what they're expected to have done. They are challenged on many, many occasions, not knowing what that child has been through the night before. The difference that it could make, we talked earlier about adverse impact, the difference that it could make to that child if someone in that school says, are you okay? Do you need lunch? Don't worry that you haven't got your homework done. So what if you haven't got the right uniform? Would you like to go to another room for half an hour? is immeasurable. I actually seen a quote around the time that we were discussing this from a teacher on social media, which I don't often quote from because I don't like it, to be honest. But it was a really good quote where the teacher had said, the difference you could make in a child's life when you meet them at the school gate and they're coming in late, instead of shouting at them, why are you late, Johnny? What kept you? Saying, are you okay, Johnny? Is everything all right? Because you don't know what's going through that what that child is going through or why they are late to school. So I thought it was very relevant, and I thought I, it certainly impacted me. And I would love if more teachers thought like that. I know we have lots and lots of brilliant teachers, but the truth is sometimes they're just under so much pressure trying to do what they have to do that they forget these things. And this might be a way of reminding them. Because I'm sure there are lots of teachers in our schools that don't realise how many children are in their classroom who are in homes where there is dom domestic abuse occurring on a day and daily basis. I have no doubt. So this could potentially make a massive difference to children's lives. And at the end of the day, that's what we're about. The PSNA have said that they want to do this, and I welcome that. And I also welcome the Education Minister's moves in relation to rolling out the, the pilot project. And hopefully, whilst there are limitations to it, I accept, hopefully that will help us and assist us whenever we do come to the rollout of this in terms of maybe flagging up some of the issues or problems or stumbling blocks. And that can only be a good thing. So for me, Operation Encompass was an absolutely vital part of this. And I do welcome that the Minister is intends to bring forward amendment at further consideration stage. And again, I think and believe that the Minister's amendment will further improve this amendment and will further improve this legislation. And that can only, again, be a positive outcome. Speaking to amendments 20, just to say that I will be supporting amendment 19, which is a minor amendment to Worden. Speaking to amendments 20, 21 and 24, I, I don't intend to go over the, the issues that the Chair has already highlighted. I think that nobody in this House can fail to know that data collection, training and reporting on anything 
it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a policy, whether it's legislation, on any issue is vital because resources follow information. Resources follow statistics. And if we don't have the statistics, we won't get the resources. We know that already from some of the groups and organisations that have highlighted the lack of resourcing that is directed towards them. And I know that Rachel Woods will speak to some of that later on and, and has raised it on numerous occasions that there are groups and organisations out there who do not get, particularly from the migrant population, who do not get adequate funding because we don't have the data, we don't have the statistics. So I think it is important that we, that we look to that data collection. Again, the reporting, the reporting feeds into all of that. And hopefully maybe the reporting might answer some of the queries that were raised by Mr Alistair around how many cases will actually be brought to court. We will know. We will not be saying to people if they come to us and ask, how good is your legislation? How effective is it? How well does it work? Well, we're not sure. We can't give you statistics. We will be able to say, that's how good it is, because there's the reporting on how effective it is on the ground. And lastly, to speak to training. Training is vital. The PSNA have said this themselves, that it could take up to a year for them to implement this legislation. And I know some of my colleagues on the committee challenged the Chief Constable in relation to this and said that it needs to be quicker and a year is too long. And maybe it is, but maybe it's not. Because I don't want quick training. I want good training. I want effective training. I want the right training. I want that when those officers get the training that they need and require, that they actually will be able to implement this legislation in the way in which we intend it in this House. We scrutinise this bill. We're debating it tonight. We are giving it every bit of attention that we possibly can to ensure that it will have the biggest impact on people's lives. We need those who are actually going to implement it and deliver on the other end of it to do the same. And they can only do that with effective training. I can certainly say at the beginning of this process, when this was sat down in front of me, it looked like double dutch. I read through it and understood bits and pieces, but truthfully, could I have spoken to it on that day and said, I fully understand everything that's in this. I fully understand the implications it will have on people's lives. I fully understand all the issues that have been raised. No, I couldn't. But I gained that through a very steep training <laughs> curve within the committee, but a very good training and learning curve. And we did have a good mix in our committee of people who had experience and those of us who were new to the, new to the experience, to say the least. So we had that mix, but we all had life experience, and we all had experience of previous roles, my own within the policing board, as I've already outlined, and just within previous roles, dealing with constituents within your own life. And all of those things added to this bill, because this is about real people. It is about real life. It's not about something that's pie in the sky or doesn't really affect people every day. This will affect people every day. So we need to ensure that those who are going to be delivering it, as I've already outlined, will get the adequate training. In relation to Amendment 25, and that is in Ms Woods' amendment around to include Section 75, I, I would love to support this amendment. And it does everything that I've just outlined we need. We need the data, we need the statistics. Unfortunately, I know from previous experience in the Policing Board that it's something that the department and that the organisations may not be able to meet. And therefore, I am not able to support it at this time, but certainly would like to have further conversations with the Minister, with the department, on whether it is something that could be included at further consideration stage and if we could get more detail around how it could be done, because that's really what it, what it boils down to for me. I want to see it done. I just need to understand how it can be done. Amendment 26, again, um, Rachel Wood's amendment. We will be supporting it, as the Minister has already outlined. She will be supporting it, and her department will be supporting it. And it breaks statistics down to council and police and district. PSNA have already confirmed to the Minister that's something that they can do. And again, I think this is important because resources, that's what it boils down to. Where will resources go? It will go to where you have data and where you have information. 
So being able to break that down, and, and for us as elected representatives to a constituency or to a council area, a police area, it gives us information on what we should be focusing on. So I think all of, the, all of those amendments are, are positive moves and I would support. And just to say again, I do welcome the Minister's indication that she will add to Operation Encompass. And I hope that we will see both PSNA and those in our education sector buy an end to this. Because I do believe, I repeat again, I do believe that it will make a real change in children's lives, a real difference in children's lives. And I, I know that most people out there teaching in our schools, that's what they want to do. That's why they're there. They want to give those children an education, but they also want to see those children coming out of that school at the end of the day. Better people, more resilient people, and young people that are able to have a better life because of what they did for them. Gormail Malcolm. I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and I rise today to speak in support uh, of Amendment 18. I'm mindful I'm not a member uh, of the Justice Committee, but I'd like to thank members and the Minister for their meaningful, uh, valuable and insightful contributions this evening. Um, I welcome the opportunity tonight uh, to speak on what is a deeply emotive and sensitive topic. Reading through the legislation, hearing testimonies from survivors uh, earlier this week in the lead up to today's discussion has been both eye-opening and, frankly, emotional. Uh, it's been truly revealing of the detrimental impact that domestic abuse has on victims, families and children. And there are so many aspects of abuse, physical, sexual, mental, emotional, financial and of course psychological. Incidents of abuse can be engraved into the minds of victims. Despite how long uh, time passes, it can be truly so difficult uh, for victims to free themselves from the grasp of their abuser. No sentence sums this up better than in the mind of the victim, trauma has no timeline, it stays with them. Many people recovering from a domestically violent relationship can experience complex PTSD, which presents itself in emotional flashbacks. If we turn our eyes to today and to the current pandemic, it is horrifying to have read articles about increased rates of domestic violence during the lockdown. The ability to be monitored by an abusive partner around the clock is deeply, deeply disturbing. I'd like to thank Women's Aid, the NSPCC, Nexus NI and Bernardo's and all other community and voluntary organisations out there for their continued efforts to support victims, especially during this difficult and challenging time. I also welcome that our Minister Mallon has worked closely with Minister Long on providing free transport for victims, a key and necessary support for victims right across the north. While well, speaking on this uh, today, I feel it would be reckless of me to not have the opportunity uh, to have the opportunity and not use it to address domestic abuse in teenage relationships. Um, previously, uh, I read uh, and I welcome the point 82 of the Community for Justice's report uh, on this bill uh, and its inclusion that schools and colleges may need to be involved as part of the coordinated response to provide education and awareness so that relevant professionals from the sector can understand the risks a young person may po pose to other young people. With Amendment 18, I welcome the amendment and the discussion of utilising reg regulations similar to Operation Encompass, the initiative which enhances communication between the police and schools where a child is at risk from domestic abuse. This will help ensure schools have more information to support safeguarding of our children here in the North. While discussing the amendments before us here today, I think it further highlights we should enable our young people to acquire the skills on decision making with a knowledge base and skills to interpret what abuse actually is. I feel it is both a moral obligation and a professional duty for our educational institutions to educate our teenagers as they navigate their first relationships, to equip them with the knowledge that will help them to enable uh, their growth and engage in healthy relationships. Speaking with representatives from Women's Aids prior to this today, they too reiterate to young people, being a victim of domestic abuse is never their fault. Abuse of control is, is, it isn't always obvious. It can be manipulation, gaslighting, someone convincing you you're not worthy of opportunities, you're not smart enough and that nobody likes you. Your partner can be one person in a room of many in front of their parents and someone very different behind closed doors. Being humiliated and intimidated by your partner is not a natural part of the process. Being told what to wear, where you can go and who you can or can't see is not the norm. Let us be reminded, while these steps taken today with this legislation is to be welcomed, 
We need a cross-departmental approach to tackle this issue to protect potential and hidden sufferers of all ages from domestic abuse. And I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, thank you. And before I begin, I want to declare an interest as a member of the Policing Board for Northern Ireland, which uh, obviously oversees the police service of Northern Ireland, and therefore some of the actions suggested in the group of amendments to which I speak. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I, I also want to take an opportunity at the beginning, uh, as one of, of those here currently who hasn't had a chance to contribute earlier in the debate, uh, to express my thanks to the Minister for bringing this bill before the Assembly and to the departmental officials for assisting in, in doing that. The Minister has paid particular attention to the issue of domestic abuse and should be commended for following through on her pledge to endeavour to deliver on this bill. In addition to her determination to deal with this issue, she has also taken on board the incredibly destructive practice of coercive control and indeed has been helpful on this issue and her responses to me and to other members asking questions in this chamber. I want to express also my gratitude to members of the committee for their scrutiny and the detail they have brought to the debate. I will in my remarks, Deputy Speaker, refer mainly to those amendments dealing with training and oversight. Training is undoubtedly fundamental in delivering appropriate outcomes on this offence, but the suggested Amendment 21 in training does not stipulate the quality or nature of the training. This could actually lead to the most basic level of training, perhaps as little as online exercises, which I hope members will agree is not what we want to see. I acknowledge that the Chair indicated earlier that the Committee will look at this again. And it's a very welcome thing because I think we know that, that the situation might well be that the uh, practice of practical or in the field or interagency training biannually could be more effective than basic online training on an annual basis. Additionally, the amendment suggests the Department of Justice is part to direct the Police Service of Northern Ireland in relation to this training, which, as we know, is not the case. PSNI reports on these matters to the Northern Ireland Policing Board, whether in full board or through relevant committees, and it is that body which should work with the PSNI on training. Uh, ministerial or departmental control on these issues is undeliverable, and in my opinion, undesirable. Reference to the department bearing responsibility for, uh, for, for training, uh, funding, delivery and reporting for other agencies Sorry. Apologies. Apologies to the member. Thank you for taking the intervention. Um, we do agree with you in relation to who, who should be responsible for the training, which is why we've spoken to the Minister about uh, an amendment at, at further consideration stage. However, I'm sure the member, and as a previous member of the Policing Board, would know and, and well that sometimes we find it difficult to tie these issues down because they are not there in legislation to hold to account to. So where we're asking the PSNI around training, you can get all sorts of reasons why that training can't happen and the training has been pushed back and the training will happen and it has been done three years ago and we'll try to do it again in two years. And we have real challenges around that. If we have something to hold them to account to, and if this is not the right way to do it, then as I've said, the Minister will be bringing forward amendments for further consideration. Can I also encourage members who wish to make an intervention to use their microphones so everyone can clearly hear it? Uh, Mr Blair. Uh, De Deputy Speaker, I want to thank the member for the intervention. I won't rehearse all the detail of the PSNI operational independence under the uh, control of the Chief Constable. However, I should point out that <coughs> excuse me, all of us in this House um, who, who are members of executive parties have representatives on that policing board and we can challenge our, our, our wishes. Uh, through them on delivery. Uh, Deputy Speaker, reference to the Department bearing responsibility for training, funding and delivery have covered. Um, that there is precedent and established practice that agencies have to prepare for, train for and adopt, adapt to new and emerging legislation. There is also placing in criminal justice oversight responsibility through, for example, the Criminal Justice Inspectorate, and this can highlight training need or required additional training, and this has been done previously. With regard to this oversight role, Mr Deputy Speaker, the suggestion in Amendment 23 of an additional oversight role um, is something which could potentially be delivered through, I think, existing structures, therefore avoiding additional time and financial resource. 
and this requires further examination also. I am hopeful that the Minister and the Committee can look further at these details around desirable levels of training and the most effective methods of training at later stages. This could include, this could include scoping existing training capacity. That is something that the Vice Chair of the Committee referred to a moment ago. Speaking generally, Deputy Speaker, I would also urge caution around amendments which require considerable IT system investment by the PSNI or other criminal justice agencies. We must be careful, in addition to capital requirement on timeframes for planning, procurement and delivery of such systems, and how this might adversely affect progress on eagerly awaited aspects of the Bill. Deputy Speaker, it is therefore my position that I hope for progress at later stages, which will reflect the practicalities around the original requirements of Amendment 21. I am opposed to the departmental direct delivery theme of Amendment 22 for reasons given previously around accountability and also because we expect independent delivery by the agencies involved. I believe the intention of uh, Amendment 23 can be met through existing resource and this should be further explored along with other matters uh, on which there is a commitment now to discuss further. I hope the Minister, the Justice Committee and members of the House can reflect upon matters I have raised. I hope more than anything um, more than anything else in relation to this debate that neither our words nor our actions of this bill progresses will divert attention from the original purpose of the bill and the needs of the victims. I call Doug Beating. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. We're fast approaching the witching hour. I'm uh, not quite there yet, but it's, but it's on its way. Um, I think about this time now, I'd be sitting at home with a nice glass of Isle of Jura, 18-year-old single malt, with my slippers and, and uh, pyjamas on. Not a great, not a great thought, but, but that would be, that would be heavy. <laughs> yeah, of course. Did a member ever go past Bush Bells? Yeah, well. Um, but I, I, and I'm not going to rehearse. I just wanted to maybe feed into a couple of the um, a couple of the amendments because I, I guess Amendment 18, the the up and compass piece. I mean, it's it's a two line amendment, but it's so incredibly important. Uh, and I think um, Ms. Dillon has been very articulate and very steadfast in, in support of that. And I just wanted to say that because it is really really important, and it is only two lines. And we do hope that we're going to be able to. To, to develop that in, in the um, uh, subsequent, subsequent consideration stage. Uh, looking at Amendment 20, um, data collection. Data collection feeds into pretty much everything. We, we don't know how things are progressing unless we gather the data to see how it's working. And it certainly feeds into uh, Ms Woods' um, Amendment 14, which is about legal aid. Um, so it's incredibly uh, important a new clause to be in there. Uh, and and I, I'm, without a doubt, I'm going to be supporting that. Uh, when I look at Amendment 21, which is an amendment about training, the first thing I will say is, is uh, I am uh, absolutely sympathetic to um, uh, the, the, the first part of that, which is uh, putting the duty on the, the um, Justice Department, and, and I guess we can look at that and possibly change that, um, uh, and I would certainly be, be happy enough to do that. Um, one thing I would say about um, this clause is that the minister came before the justice committee and we talked it through um, and then the minister took away her clause so ours stood alone uh, in regards to this but that to me is good collaboration to me that's exactly the way we should be doing things talk it through and then make a decision and then we can change it at, at, a, at a later stage and, and I commend the minister uh, for taking that approach but there are two things within that, uh, and the chair has already said it, and I said it at the time, which I think is incredibly important, and that is the word annually and the word mandatory. We have to do it annually. How we do it to create less pressure on the organisations is, is something they have to think through. But it, but it has to be done annually, and it must be mandatory for those people um, who, who are dealing with domestic abuse on a day-to-day on -day basis basis. But the reality is every organisation needs to be trained from the very top to the very bottom. So in the police, it needs to be from the chief constable all the way down to the new recruit. They need to have an understanding how this works. And then the second tier of training will be for those people who end up as a subject matter expert, so to speak, uh, in regards to domestic abuse. So um, again, we will be supporting that, uh, but I will be sympathetic to uh, the Minister if she brings forward any amendments uh, in regards uh, to that. And the last one I want to feed into 
uh, is Amendment 23, another new clause, which is the independent um, oversight. Uh, people have said so already, and I will say it again. We had lots of people who wanted a domestic abuse commissioner, and they will be incredibly disappointed that they don't get a domestic abuse commissioner. And, and I, accept, I accept that. Um, some of you will may know that I actually want a victims of crime commissioner because um, domestic abuse fits into crime uh, of all shapes and sizes. Uh, you know, it, it, it bleeds into, uh, into financial crime, um, uh, denial of rights, freedom of movements, false imprisonments, grievous bodily harm, attempted murder, and in extremes it gets into murder. Um, so domestic abuse isn't a standalone um, thing. It, it, just, it, it just moves into um, and blurs uh, other offences. Um, so I believe a Victims of Crimes Commissioner can cover that role in the long term. Um, uh, that a domestic abuse commissioner would have done. But this clause, what it does, it covers the medium term. It covers the first seven years so that we can have oversight to make sure it's working because this is new legislation and we need to make sure that it is doing exactly what it's designed to be doing and we need somebody to be looking at to make sure, somebody independent to be looking at that to make sure it's doing what it's designed uh, to be doing. Um, I, 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 will, I, mean, I, mean, I will leave it there, um, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, certainly will be supporting Amendment 26. Can't support uh, Amendment uh, 25, uh, unfortunately. Um, and, yeah, that'll do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, this is my opportunity now to uh, applaud another member of the Justice Committee, uh, Ms Linda Dillon, for her work and her determination in this regard. I'm mindful that my Chief Whip is behind me, Mr Deputy Speaker, and he's always us, encouraging us to be rough and robust, and I'm going weak at the knees here on him. But, but, but can I just say that Linda, Linda Dillon has done a tremendous piece of work pushing this issue, pushing this issue right to the Committee's foresight and mindset, because this is an important issue. It's a very small amendment, but it's the little things that count. It's the little things that count when you're under the cosh, when you're under pressure as a parent or even as a child. And you know, teachers know their pupils very well. Teachers are caring individuals who want the best for their pupils. And I suspect they can tell. I suspect they know that something's awry and something's up. But what this, what this does, it confirms. It gives them the assurance to know that what they're doing and saying is the right thing to do. So I applaud Linda Adelman for the work on this and the perseverance, because it is right that we insert this into this bill. Because Yes, yes, I will. Will the member agree with me that in relation to this issue, the same as all of the other issues, training will be vital because we do want to ensure that that information is shared in the appropriate way to protect everybody. We want to support those children. We also want to protect them. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. And I'll get on to training in a wee, minute, a wee minute. But but on on encompass the puzzling thing for us on the committee was this: we identified that there was a problem. We identified there was a gap. People were telling us, no less the police were telling us there was a gap. But we could never ever identify the cause of that gap. Which was really, really strange and puzzling. So there's absolutely no doubt it needs to be in. And then that gives us a cast iron guarantee. Yes, I'll give away the minister. I thank the member for giving way. I would just draw his attention to the fact that actually the department wrote um, to members and set out what the gap in legislation was. Um, but that it was our view that it was primarily an education issue. However, subsequent to that, we continued to receive written questions asking what the gap was after we'd sent the letter which described it. Yeah, and, and there's no doubt, you know, I, I, and I'll admit it uh, in this House for Hansard that, yeah, I'm still confused on this issue. Uh, because, on the one hand, we're told that there's no, we're told by the police that there's no provision and they worry about information sharing. 
But on the other hand, there's actually a live um, a pilot scheme that's ongoing. And again, that just added confusion to the round as we were debating this in the committee. But I'm glad that the PSNI will now have the reassurance to go. And, and again, if, 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 this, if this amendment doesn't do it, then certainly let's, let's get it fixed the next, at the next stage. And can I just say that it is important to note, because I will have to heap praise on the Minister too, that the amendment that she brought forward is very thick, it's very good reading, and it, super merit, and I suspect that's what we'll be looking at at further consideration stage. So I thank the Minister for her input in this. I thank the Minister for her engagement with the committee on this. And I think there's a real spirit here of coordination and teamwork. And I think at the end of this, we'll have a very good piece of legislation, a part of legislation on this, because it's the little things that matter. So when that child who has just witnessed a horrendous scene, even the night before, even hours before school time, that the teacher knows that that child may not come in, may be late, may not have uniform on, may not have homework done, and, it, and the child's behaviour might not be appropriate. And you can understand all the reasons why that would be. And that's why we talk about joined up government here. In the real world, people need joined up services. And this is just, yes, give away the minister. I thank the member for giving way again. He has said that he isn't um, that he isn't clear about what the, if you like, the issue was, the gap was. The police already have the power to share information with educators where it relates to safeguarding. So, for example, a child not being fed, a child not um, having a coat. Those sorts of issues can already be reported to educators, and that information can be shared. They cannot do it for the purposes of well-being. So, for example, to support a child emotionally through those difficulties. And that is where Operation Encompass, that is where the gap in the law exists, that where abuse doesn't lead, if you like, to actual harm, which is the debate we had earlier, um, that there may be no virus for the police to share information uh, with the schools in order to allow them to do that. So that's the distinction, if that makes it any clearer um, for members. And I thank the Minister because it does, it does actually make it, and again, when you're going through all this thing in your head, you do tend to miss things, or I do anyway. Uh, so I, I thank the Minister for that clarification. Um, there's no doubt uh, it, it, it's, it's a good piece, it's a good thing that these services can engage and can give as full a picture to the teacher, to the educator as possible. Because you know, with that child's experience, adverse uh, behaviour and everything else that they have experienced over the, the night before, the week before, the month before, going into school and getting into trouble again, uh, or getting into trouble, can only spiral that child to even deeper depths. And when we need the educator to be informed in order to pull that child up to give it some support, to give the child some support. That's what we need to see, that's what we need to do, because at the centre of all of this legislation, a child, a ch uh, does Ms Woods want to come in? Yeah, sir. Thank the member for giving way, and I was going to address it in my notes later on, but the subject of well-being has been brought up, that there was no provision um, about well-being. There is a provision about well-being already within our statute books, indeed, the Children's Services Cooperation Act received royal assent in 2015, brought to this House by my predecessor, Stephen Agnew. The stated aim of that act is to improve cooperation amongst departments and agency and places a duty on children's authority, as defined by the act, to cooperate where appropriate as they deliver services aimed at improving, and this is crucial, for the well-being of children and young people. I thank Ms Woods for that intervention and, again, very helpful. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I'll give away the message. To be clear, I did not say that it was not possible for the agencies to cooperate. The issue is specific to information and data sharing, private information um, about families, and that is not covered, um, as has been suggested. OK, thank you, Minister. And it's great fun being a conduit between two members. It really is. Uh, so uh, 
that's why encompass is so important, and that's why we've had to put it into the bill. Uh, and I, I'm glad that the minister uh, supports that, and we'll work with her, no doubt, in the next stage to to fix, to, not to fix it, to strengthen it, is the way I would put it. Amendment 19. Uh, yes, support the minister in that regard. Uh, Amendment 20. Uh, the guidance on data collection. We heard earlier from Mr Alistair in particular the angst that he has with this new offence. So I think it's fatally important that data is collected and that we can use that data in good ways and means. And it is important. I think it gives us all reassurance that we'll be able to attest this legislation to ensure that it is fit for purpose. But there's absolutely no doubt about it. If training isn't fit for purpose, then this legislation will not be fit for purpose either. And what I mean by that, I have past experience in this again, Mr Deputy Speaker. I brought to this House, in this very legislation, and in this very legislator, this very assembly, the Child Protection Disclosure Scheme. That was my amendment to a Justice, I think Justice Number Two Bill, I think, maybe Justice Number One. I can't remember. But I brought that, and that was passed by this House. This House passed the Child Protection Disclosure Scheme. And it's fair to say that that piece of legislation was ignored by the PSNI. It sat sat and went nowhere. And it was only when I kicked up and asked questions and fought with the police and met with the police and there was change with regards to positions that somebody took that police officer, it's not fair to name him, but he took that and not name, fair to name her too because there was two people involved to be fair and um, one has moved on now. But they picked that up and they ran with it. And they relaunched that child protection disclosure scheme, whereby parents get to find out information about someone who could be a threat to their child. Why is it that the parent is always the last to know? And the police ignored that legislation, that piece of legislation. Now, I'm glad to say that has been relaunched, reinvigorated, and it's being promoted and advertised even now on the internet. Can I draw the member at this later back to yep. the, member, the amendments in front of us? Yep, and that's why, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's so important that training is there to ingrain this legislation into the mindset of all the services that will use it. It is vitally important that the police and others get adequate training and that there is independent oversight and that's why it's important also the independent oversight to ensure that this legislation is being enacted, that this legislation is being used, and that this legislation is serving the public out there and serving and protecting the victims and putting the perpetrators behind bars. That's why we need the training. That's why we need the independent oversight. And, of course, the operation report on the operation of the Act. Absolutely. This, can't, this is too important. This is too cutting edge. This is too new for us to let it go into the ether whenever it leaves this House. We need to keep an eye on this. We need to keep on the ball and to ensure that this legislation is fit for a purpose and it actually works. It actually works to serve the people. Uh, and I would have doubts around that if that training wasn't sufficient and adequate and wasn't routine. And, and it is, I, I get the Minister when she says about the police do not train on any particular offence and that this could set a precedent. But I say, I say, why not? Why not? If, if an offence is a new offence, if it's fresh, if it's a new concept, we, we can see how the judicial system could struggle with it. Yeah, I will give way to the Minister. To clarify again, what I said was that the police do not train people annually in regard to any offence. I didn't say that they didn't train people in regard to new offences. Okay, and I'm happy to clarify that position and to correct myself. 
on that. But on, on the annual training, on the annual training, it's fair. And, and Doug Beatty will have massive experience in this regard. And I have a wee bit about the annual training that the Royal Irish go through every year to hone skills, to keep it fresh, and to keep, it, to keep you alert on the presence of the procedure, the standard operating procedure, and in this case, the law. So there's absolutely no reason why we can't have a rigorous training regime. Now, that training doesn't necessarily have to be uh, all overwhelming. It can just be a, uh, an annual thing that keeps everybody on their toes and keeps, every, keeps it alert and fresh in people's minds. And that's basically what we've been asking here. But, but it's vital. Training is vital, along with the independent oversight, along with the, the data collection, and the, along with the reporting on the operation of this Act. This is a key piece. This cannot be ignored, shouldn't be ignored, and we need to keep on top of it. I leave it there. Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Gemma Dolan. Gormay, I'll get last can call you. Um, I remember clearly the, the first time I was introduced to the term domestic abuse and what it meant. I was 16 years old, and from Anna Women's Aid came into my school to give a presentation to our year group. What I remember standing out to me from that presentation was that domestic abuse is not just physical. That was about 14 years ago, and to this day, that presentation remains one of the more valuable things that I learned in school. From then on, I went on to partake in training on domestic and sexual violence awareness with Fermanagh Women's Aid in 2018. And given that, it has been a privilege for me to be a member of the Justice Committee and to be able to shape this bill to ensure the protection of the thousands of victims who, through no fault of their own, are abused at the hands of their spouse, partner or family member. And as this is my first opportunity to speak on the bill today, um, at this point I want to commend my fellow committee members for the thorough scrutiny of this, the Minister and the Department of Justice for bringing this forward in a timely manner, all of the groups and organisations who provided both written and oral evidence to help better inform us, and of course a special thanks to the victims who provided written and oral evidence of their experience. It's unfortunate that legislation of this nature is acquired, but from listening to these groups and the victims, there is no denying that it is absolutely needed. Incidents of domestic violence are now at an all-time high, but that's not a high that we can be proud of. As shocking and as harrowing as the statistics are, in some cases, they are only the tip of the iceberg. Because, as most of us know, it usually takes several incidents to happen before the victim actually realises they are being abused, or for the victim to build up the courage to lift the phone. So in some cases, this phone call or plea for help may actually never happen. Is this coercive control is a special one-off documentary on BBC Three, compromise of a social experiment, a group of young people aged between 18 and 30 who come together to consider whether they truly understand what constitutes coercive control. 70% of people failed to see the signs of coercive control in this new BBC show. This highlights the education and training that is required around this behaviour and therefore I welcome Amendment 21 which would insert a clause and put a statutory duty on DOJ to ensure that sufficient training of policing and criminal justice agencies, including PPS and court service staff. Throughout the committee's considerations of the bill, one of the most prominent reoccurring themes from organisations was the need for comprehensive training for anyone involved in gathering evidence, prosecuting and enforcing the new law, and that the success of this, this legislation will be dependent on the effectiveness of this training. It is essential that all first responders and criminal justice agencies fully understand what coercive control is and are able to recognise the signs of coercive and controlling abusive behaviour. Indeed, this was recognised by the PSNA in its written submission to the committee, where it recognised that officer training on the definition of the new offence and examples of the behaviour it involves will be pivotal for the successful enforcement of the legislation, a view echoed by the Chief Constable. This also requires appropriate resourcing and investment in training, and I fully expect the Minister to step up in this regard. 
A great example of this training is again from Anna Women's Aid, who have undertaken an education programme targeted at those in the beauty industry, among other sectors, and being able to spot the signs, but also being able to sign post if a client confides in them that they are a victim of domestic abuse. Similar to the training that I took part in all those years ago in 2018, this is an invaluable exercise in trying to eradicate domestic abuse. And as a society, we should all take some responsibility to educate ourselves. We need to know the difference in abusive and non-abusive relationships. We need to challenge assumptions about gender and power. And we need to help young people to understand that abuse is a crime. And now, as has already been previously mentioned, so I do apologise, but we had hoped to bring forward an amendment proposing a statutory entitlement to 10 days domestic violence paid leave for all workers. Domestic violence can affect employment, productivity and health and safety. Domestic violence often follows... Can, can I remind the member we're debating the amendments in front of us yeah. at the moment and at this stage that's the appropriate issues yeah. to be commenting yeah, on? Yeah, I'm just coming to a conclusion here. Uh, um, there's a growing recognition that domestic abuse is a workplace issue and in the absence of workplace policies, colleagues and managers are not equipped to support victims and ensure they are safe. Earlier today... Yes, it is today. Sinn Féin TDs in the South introduced legislation which would provide a statutory entitlement to 10 days paid leave for victims of domestic abuse, regardless of what sector they're working. This has been brought... This, we were informed that this is outside the scope of the bill and we accept this. Um, the Minister for the Economy did say that she would bring this forward in the future and I want to make sure that um, this is brought forward because it's a vitally important issue and an absolute priority. Gormayogat. I call Mark Durkin. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. My colleague and the SDLP Justice Spokesperson, Sinead Bradley, will set out the SDLP's position on each amendment, so I don't intend to take up too much of the House's time at this late, late hour. Suffice to say, though, that I support this bill and those amendments that will help tackle the scourge of domestic abuse. Lockdown has been a challenge for all of us, but for many victims of domestic abuse confined to their homes when home is not a safe place, lockdown has been extremely dangerous. This evening, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm going to focus my remarks on amendments 21, 23 and 26. It wasn't that long ago that the prevailing attitude was that these were private matters, certainly within the lifetime of many of us here. But, it is, but there is at last a recognition that domestic abuse is a public concern and a realisation that it requires a strong public response. This group of amendments is crucial to ensuring, monitoring and measuring the effectiveness of that response. Making psychological abuse and coercive control an offence, as Section 1 of this bill would, reflects how public understanding of domestic abuse has evolved. Just over four years ago, in this chamber, I proposed an amendment to a motion here on domestic abuse, rape and sexual crime, in which I called on the then Minister to criminalise such patterns of abuse and coercive control that victims are subjected to by their abusers. The Minister, Claire Sugden, was most receptive, and I'm sure she and many others in here and outside will share my frustration that, due in no small part to a three-year political standoff that left us with no Assembly, we are only able to do that now. But let's hope that's all behind us. And anyone following this debate, I don't know how many follow debates in here at the best of times, let alone uh, close to midnight, but anyone watching here tonight couldn't fail to be impressed and maybe a wee bit surprised at the collegiate approach and even camaraderie that parties have shown to legislating on this significant and sensitive issue. So well done and let's have more of it. Interestingly, during that debate, Four years ago, I referenced a pioneering storyline from the long-running radio soap, The Archers, that highlighted the issue of coercive control in a gripping but sensitive manner. Four years on, all of the major TV soaps have done coercive control storylines. But these are more than titillating story arcs that grip viewers. 
These stories save lives. There are people, women and men, who have been subjected to this type of abuse for years without even recognising themselves as the victim of anything. It may not be, Mr Deputy Speaker, until they see what is happening to Yasmin in Coronation Street or Chantel in EastEnders that the penny drops. And that's why it's important that we piggyback on vehicles like this to get out vital public information, messages of support and, crucially, offers of help to victims. Sadly, however, domestic abuse is not confined clearly to our airwaves or screens, nor is it manifested only through physical violence. Often physical advice or attacks occur only after a victim has been cut off from support networks, emotionally abused and manipulated to the point that they are more likely to just accept physical violence or are too afraid to leave. Many of us will know people who have been through this. More worryingly, many of us will know people who are going through this and we do not even realise it. This underlines, as if it was needed, the importance of Amendment 21 and training. If agencies can't spot abuse, what chance do they have of stopping abuse? And while coercive control can preempt or reinforce physical abuse, it is a form of abuse in its own right, with lasting harm on victims. So, like others, I welcome this progress, but I also recognise the particular difficulties that other jurisdictions have seen in securing convictions for this type of abuse. It's not just the difficulties we already face in securing convictions for physical abuse. There will be other evidential challenges, particular to the type of behaviour that causes psychological harm which is why Amendments 24 and 26 are so important, ensuring that the data is there to monitor and understand how it translates from statute into practice. Victims need to have confidence that their experiences will be recognised as abuse and confidence in the process. The opportunity this bill represents will be squandered if, firstly, cases are not brought where appropriate and secondly, convictions do not follow. Amendment 23, providing for independent oversight, is also important in this regard, particularly given the lack of a domestic abuse commissioner. On another point, which I will deal with quickly, I know that the committee has considered the issue of parental alienation, and I know the Dolce Vita project from my own constituency have been to the fore on this issue. Many of the cases this bill will be relevant to are those that mean children are safer with supervised contact or no contact at all with a parent. However, there are other cases in which abuse by one parent or an, of another is not the issue, but children's relationships with one parent suffers as a result of a breakdown in the adult relationship. I would be grateful if the Minister could confirm in her response what aspects of this overlap between her department and the Department of Health and importantly, how departments can work together to address this difficult issue that undoubtedly causes much hurt and harm. Amendment 21. Certainly. I thank the member for highlighting the La Dolce Vida project. And we obviously met with them during the, the process as a committee, and I have met with them as an individual MLA. And I've actually suggested to them, because some of their ideas around how you could deal with parental alienation does not actually fall within the legislative um, sphere, it's, but some really good ideas around pilot, types of pilot projects and things that could be done. And I think that they have a lot to offer in relation to that. And I have suggested to them that they should come to the committee in relation to that specific issue outside of this piece of legislation and that we would certainly want to look at this as a, as a wider issue because it's not always legislation that deals with these issues and I think that's what the member is alluding to. No, thank you. I, I thank the member for the intervention and certainly recognise the complexity uh, of the issue and I suppose the importance of how we can work together and how departments can work together to help uh, re reduce the incidence of this form of abuse. Amendment 21, with its focus on training, is most positive 
and will be broadly welcomed by victims and many organisations working in the sector. I would like to take this opportunity to put on record our gratitude to those hard-working and hard-pressed organisations that support victims, Women's Aid, obviously Victim Support, Men's Action Network, Men's Advisory Project, Nexus, the aforementioned La Dolce Vita Project. But these groups need more than warm words. I think Ms Dillon uh, referred to this. They also need cold, hard, financial and practical support. We must do more to support them in their work, changing and, without doubt, in many cases, saving lives. Mr Speaker, I will conclude by saying that I hope this bill can send a strong message to victims of domestic abuse that they have our full support, and to perpetrators that there will be zero tolerance. But moreover, I hope that message is followed through with results. I believe those amendments that we are supporting will strengthen our efforts to do just that. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Colin Gillerney, Chair of the Health Committee. Can call you. And, uh, I, I want to speak to the elements that the, committee, the Health Committee have looked at in relation to this, and to again just emphasise that, that we are very aware that this is largely a Justice Committee piece of work and a piece of work that we have welcomed. Um, the Health Committee looked at the implementation and operation of the offence and welcomes debate on the need for additional training for frontline workers. The committee welcomed discrete recognition in the bill of the damage that can be done to children and young people by seeing or hearing domestic abuse or by being involved in abuse, such as when a child is used to contribute to emotional or psychological distress. This connects with a further cross-cutting area of policy in relation to adverse childhood experiences. Stakeholders flagged for us the issue of underreporting and communication issues around domestic abuse incidents, plus the fact the Protect Life 2 suicide strategy acknowledges the domestic abuse victims as at, at, an at-risk group. The committee therefore recommended that statutory guidance and associated training be provided to frontline responders on the implementation of clauses 8 and 9 in particular. Again, the committee has not formally considered the particular wording of amendments dealing with training, but would support the objective in principle, and I do note the Minister um, not moving uh, 15. If I may, um, John Corley, I just want to share, uh, reflect on some of my own experience in relation to this, and indeed as, as part of the reason why I'm so pleased to be part of this debate tonight, and I was reflecting on Linda Dillon saying that while some of us may not be experienced legislators, we have experience in all sorts of way, ways that are relevant to this debate. And I just want to um, share with, with the members uh, an experience that I had in terms of my own social work role and while I, was, while I was actually in training for that role. I worked with a woman who, as I got to know her and explained her story to me, I set out in detail something that I found truly shocking, but which I have, I have been further shocked to find out since is not as uncommon as many of us would like to believe. This woman had, and this is going back to when, when she got married, it would be 25 or 30 years ago, but she had married her childhood sweetheart, had known him for many, many years, and in her words, you couldn't meet a nicer fella until the day they were married. They returned, as was the tradition at the time, to the, the family home after the wedding, and he raped her. Now, that woman escaped out the upstairs window of a two-story house, ran naked to the police station, and told them what had happened. She was put into a police car, wrapped in a jacket, put into a police car by a policeman and a policewoman, and returned to the family home, whereupon they knocked the door, they got the, uh, they got the abuser out of his sleep, and they asked him had he raped her, which he, of course, denied. She then, in front, of, in front of her abuser, they then asked, was she happy to remain and to stay at the home? And she told me, and this has stayed with me since, with her mouth, she, she had to say, yes, I'm happy to stay. With her eyes, she was trying to tell the policewoman to take her with her. Now, I raise that because I don't actually think that legislation makes the difference in a case like that. And I know we have achieved much and have much more to do. 
but I actually think it was the training that makes the difference in relation to the implementation of many of these legislation. And I did have the benefit of having significant and valuable training in my social work role as part of multidisciplinary teams in the recognition of domestic abuse and coercive control. And I have to say that I was struck on several occasions by the fact that around the table of that multi-professional multi setting, some of the most valuable peer uh, training experience I had was from members of the police because they, they got it and they recognised it. And they recognised it because they were trained in how to recognise it, in how to spot the problem and how to engage with it, to deal with it. So I just wanted to share that in relation to the value of training. Legislation is not the complete answer. The training is the part that adds, I think, the real value. And I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the opportunity to speak on the Domestic Abuse Bill 